Hello everyone, how are we doing today? Oh good lord, that looks like it's going up loud. Let me turn that down a bit so that's probably a bit more sensible volume wise. Yowza, that was loud. Yeah, right. So, how are we doing today? On a good day? Hello, Albert Zasky. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Buckamere, good evening. Felix B, hello from the Alps, or rather close by it. Well, that's still the Alps. Hello, Peter Davison. I think there'll be a very good talk in two days' time. Well, I'd hope so. Been using this for quite a lot today. Fair aircraft since 1916. Also, maybe a hint of a future one. Supermarine aircraft since 1914. And I've got a few others as well. Including some which goes into some of the American aircraft, uh, aircraft manufacturers. So, you know, slowly could work my way through them. I do like the Putnam series. They're good, uh, they're good books. Uh, in car. Uh, Dawson, Western Wyvern was overtaken by the jet Aven uh, change. Well, Greg Salski, hello, and DGV40, hello. Ian Carr, the Western Wyvern, does feature today. It was part of the air groups. Uh, Janeworth, hello. Fluffy research assistants are downstairs. I was walking one before I got on. Well, I was walking the rather large, the senior fluffy research assistant, um, before we went live because I thought he could do with a bit of a walk to make him happy. Mm -hmm. Hello, Aviator Enterprise. Hello, Derp Squad. Pete Davison. The Mark One was a contemporary of the Supermarine Spiteful and the Hawker Sea Fury, and a Fairy Spearfish. Some of the others were also cancelled due to the end of the war. The Fairy Spearfish is a cool aircraft which just doesn't get off the ground, really. Hello, Jess P. Hello, Constantinus. I'm still alive somehow. Well, that's always good. HMS Ford. Hello. Blue Buddha. Hello. Derp Squad. In summary, the major change caused by the introduction of the Jet Carriers was that it was much easier for the deck crew to keep their hands warm. You'd think, but actually, the exhaust from the piston engines were quite good. Hello, DM Carpenter. In car, the effect of the rubber flight deck on the early jet age of naval warfare strategy tactics. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into some of those. Hello, Sean Mac and Strub. Hello, Doctor. What jet aircraft do you think was able to take uh, fully take over the strike mission from the piston aircraft? The Seahawk was very good. We'll be getting into this. Um, but really, the Buccaneer was where it got very, very good. I would say the fighter role is taken over in many ways by the Sea Venom, but we'll be getting into those. So. Boom. Not that that's the wrong one. Right one. So this is Patron 11, as proposed by Adrenal, and it's rather cool. I rather like it. You're going to be interested to see a very, very wordy slide is the next slide, and I do apologize for this, but I had to go somewhere to establish a baseline because the effect of early jet age, of the early jet age and how it affected naval strategy and ta strategy tactics means that I have to, at some point, establish a baseline and an end line. And I used my baseline as the end of World War II, and my end line as 1960, broadly speaking. Mainly because I could either cover these things in no detail, or I could cover them in very much detail, but then there was only so many slides you can do in approximately, well, usually I aim for the slides to cover about two hours. And then an hour of Q&A, roughly speaking. So, you know. That's how these things work. Right. As you can see, I'm wearing my um, 
the Black Seahawks t-shirt, which if you're as old as me and you went down to RNS Cold Rose many years ago, there was a lovely little cafe slash shop of the Naval Air Museum of the Royal Naval Air Museum um, at at Cold Rose in down in near Helston in Cornwall. And it was lovely. And it used to have its own line in T-shirts, its own line things. It was always full. And you would literally go in there, have a very nice piece of cake, a very nice pasty, and usually a can of iron brew and a chocolate milkshake. Um, because they did very nice mint chocolate milkshakes. So I'd have the iron brew, then I'd have a milk chocolate ice cream. Yeah. And watch the Royal Navy's helicopter fleet go through its paces, broadly speaking, because they're based down there, and the Seahawks. And I have to say, I was very lucky. When I was uh, no, quite young, I managed to do a week's worth of work experience down there because I was really interested in the fleet era, and I, my mum and me managed to nag the right people, which meant I got work experience down there. And my work experience was with 824 Squadron, who were at that point the Merlin conversion and entry unit, which really much shows my age. And I also did some time with the Black Seahawks, uh, who are now seven, uh, who are now I think they've moved all sorts of different squadron names, but they're now actually a proper fleet air arm squadron. And they are the unit which does all the checking and simulates missile attacks and air attacks on the Royal Navy as part of FOST. So they're really quite cool. And they fly these really, really cool Hawks. And when I say fly them, I mean they consider anything above, ooh, I don't know, 20 centimeters off the ground to be high altitude. Um, honestly, they to get to altitude, get to flying heights, they have to retract the undercarriage because honestly, that makes them too high. They're a really cool unit. As always, before I start, and I can say this by saying, the reminder has just flashed in. <laughs> so, thank you to the very special person who's watching, whose message reminded me to do this. Um... If you like the videos, please do subscribe. Please do press the like button. Please press the little bell. Please come to Discord or go to Patreon. And I will... I've forgotten again to upload the slides. I will upload the slides. I do promise. Anyway, this is the very, very wordy, wordy slide. Uh, slide. So we'll get through this. Because it's very, very wordy. So... The leading edge of tactics for air defense at sea by the end of World War II is in America called the Big Blue Blanket. Now, this is technically developed in 1943-44. It, it, it the idea is in 1943, but it's fully implemented by 1944. Uh, involves an American picket, uh, picket warships, usually destroyers, but also cruisers and frigates, Sometimes from the Royal Australian Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, or the Royal Navy, but, you know, as well, uh, would use radars to detect incoming Japanese aircraft. They'd radio disinformation to the American uh, fighters of the Combat Air Patrol, and then those fighters would then intercept the incoming Japanese aircraft before they could reach the carriers. It's a great idea. It's treated as amazing by the American Navy and tremendously innovative. And when you read certain books, you'll be told that is the be all and end all and amazing thing that comes out of World War II. There is one small problem with that. The British have been service been developing something called fighter direction since the 1930s exercise. And they developed it pre-war, just about, sort of it comes into this real sort of the ideas in about 1937-38. And then it's used in the Mediterranean and primarily. The be uh, beginning of the war, the difference, the principal difference between how Britain starts it off and how America is implementing it later on is that Britain's starting it off when they have very few radar, uh, radar units and they're mostly on the aircraft carriers. So the aircraft carriers, your fighter direction unit and all these things. 
In fact, the Americans are very, very interested in USS Robin, a.k.a. HMS Victorious. And here's one of the quotes I found from Jamie's Armoured Carriers page on USS Robin, which there should be a link to in the description below. As mentioned above, the FDO was efficiently laid out, that's the Fire Direction Office, was laid out to provide quick and efficient means to coordinate the Combat Air Patrol, or CAP. The four-channel wireless system allowed a single radio channel to be dedicated to radar sightings of incoming planes, and a second channel to be dedicated to fleet sightings. This system allowed for efficient dissemination of sightings to fighters in the CAP. This USN system relied heavily on radio silence due to surprise being of utmost importance in carrier-to-carrier -carry battles, because the Japanese had an effective, uh, efficient radio direction fighting system. This forced the USN to use different radio assets, radio sets, and many different radar sets within the current carrier to detect the enemy, and he used VHF sets that were restricted to a line-of-sight radius. Once the raid was detected, the entire system was switched to a medium frequency, all of which was communicated through radio transmissions. The problem with the system was that the, car the other radio traffic was also transmitted over the same frequency of the two sets, causing a lot of traffic over one channel. Now, here's the thing. I would point out the big blue blanket which FACT develops builds on the technology available at the time and is really cool. But also, the Americans have been developing something earlier than that as well. So when you see the narrative that FACT comes up with something that's just amazing and is completely brand new, that is a, a very nice history to catch on, but it's not the true history. It glosses over the fact that this was an evolutionary development, and that's a very good, the American side of it. But the British have their own side. And the ones who really don't are the major carrier powers, uh, carrier powers are the Japanese. But let's be honest, they have other structural issues. And the reason they probably don't have that by the end of World War II is because their ideas of being, having it at the beginning of World War II are mostly dead by that point. Because instead of being like the Royal Navy and the US Navy, who, when they've got really, really good pilots, bring them back to, tra to train others and then deploy them into new squadrons, and so are constantly cycling experienced officers and experienced pilots and observers through the system so they get time away, so they can pass on their experience to raise up the quality of new intakes whilst also uh, providing a balance of experience on the front line. It works with the British and the American systems as that, and so that allows them to maintain a lot of the thought process far more coherently and retain the institutional memory far more effectively. But, you know, it happens. Hi, Martin Doc. Sean Mac, sounds like concentrated diabetes. Big blue blanket. That's good. Iron brew and chocolate milkshake sounds like questionable combination. The iron brew was drunk first, and then it was the lovely mint chocolate milkshake. That's uh, Thompson. Lunchtime leftover beating like bread. <laughs> Hope you and my sister enjoyed your Kirk impersonation. They they have to put up with many impersonations. We we won't go there. And Carl's gonna go bird. Quick side tip: Were there radar pickets, submarines, or they were just planned and discarded? They had the idea for them, but <sighs> the trouble is again. A submarine, a radar unit, is quite a delicate instrument. So if you're going to have to do a crash dive and get it down, that's going to delay you getting down. And a submarine's main protection against their attack is to dive. So radar picket submarines, not really that great idea. But saying that, what they do do is use submarines which have uh, ray, uh, have antennae which listen for that they can stick out the water that can listen for the transmissions to go on with launch aircraft, the radio work that's going on, and they provide an alert. So it's more of a passive alert system than an active one, which when it's effectively implemented. Sure, Mike, the blue blanket was certainly a good tactic. There is a more of an effect, uh, a more of an active than the original British, and also nothing is new ever. Yes. And you also have to remember the British system had evolved since the, the the USS Robin report is a report from 1942. Okay, 
And that's the report of what the British had going in 1942, which is an evolution of what the British had going in 1938, which is then the British Pacific Fleet has a different system going in 1945. And it's often going, oh, they're doing the same as the big blue blanket. And then you go, well, hang on, no, they've got, di they're using different radio sets. They're doing it differently still. And the, often the difference is because the British have got, managed to be training these fighter direction officers and these radar direction officers over a longer time. So it's going to sound strange. The Americans have a larger number of experienced personnel because of the crucible that is the Pacific War. But the British experienced personnel tend to be more experienced by the end of World War II because they've been going, many of the ones going into it in the Pacific Fleet have already been in the Mediterranean Fleet, the North Atlantic, and done all sorts of fun things throughout the war and in the Indian Ocean and various other things, and have also been reading the reports of the Pacific and these things. So they've built up quite a lot of experience. And most of the British found actually, quite a lot of the officers, and especially the air defense officers, found the Pacific. Whilst they considered the Japanese to be far more coordinated in many respects, and especially due to the kam kamikazes, far more dangerous than uh, the Germans or Italians had been at their height in the Mediterranean, they weren't quite as capable of easily finding them as the Germans and the Italians were in the Mediterranean, where there wasn't really as much space to go and move your fleet. Well, say one. American converted several radar picket submarines in the route to plan invasion of Japan and built the sort of so, uh, sailfish, salmon, and nuclear powered Triton. Mm hmm. They did lots of lots of things. Not saying that they consider it. It's one of those things. It's it's an often looked at idea because it's a lovely idea, but then they try and practically implement it. And a lot of these subs get converted into electronic warfare submarines. And they do very, very good work as that. Because if you consider an electronic warfare submarine is actually playing to the strength of the US of those submarine of a submarine, whereas a radar picket submarine is playing against the strength of the submarine. So electronic warfare capabilities, which are now pretty standard on attack submarines, for that reason, play to the strength, because they keep the submarine covert. Mm. <sighs> Ian Carl, the number of different radar sets on Iron Strip seems quite extensive. Yes, they do. Uh, one of the reasons why they're quite extensive and one of the things that does change over time after World War II is they start standardizing is because literally as soon as some sets are ready, they're sent off and they might be slightly different to the batch before them. And they might, again, information is coming back and those sets are constantly developing. So you'll find batch one will be built. And then they've got ideas and they'll implement batch two. And then by the time they've uh, finished batch two, they've got uh, information back from batch one about how they're operating. So they'll implement batch three, which will have the information from batch one and the ideas from batch two. And then bat you can guess what happens with batch four. That's the ideas from batch two and batch one. And they don't go do And so you find the British are. Uh, the radar is developing in boom, leaps and leaps and leaps. And as are the Americans one, because they they are developing the radar. The Americans look less busy because they tend to run slightly bigger production runs. Whereas the British are going, they're trying to implement, because of the Mediterranean, because of the nature of fighting inshore so often, as they do in dealing with Norway, North Sea, and the Mediterranean, they want to implement those changes far more quickly. And as um, there's a gentleman called Trent Delanco, who is a lovely guy who sometimes is in the chat, 
and does send me long, long messages and very useful messages on Twitter. And a very great conversation. In fact, he sent me one recently and I haven't responded to him yet and I've got to get back to him. But it is uh, the, the, one of the things that comes through is the sheer scale of development that's going on in radar. And one of the reasons why the Americans are slightly slower in terms of their evolution is because they're having trouble making them work perfectly as well as they should do in the Pacific. Because they work well on paper and they're working fine in that one environment, but they're not working fine in the other environment. And then they ask why the bridge is So, the thing is, for the bridge system, I couldn't find a decent diagram. And you will see later in this, I actually had trouble finding a decent diagram. So I ended up drawing my own. Uh, well, actually, when I say draw my own, I didn't draw my own today. I, 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 drawn it, I drew it a few years ago, and I still use it for teaching. But um, you can see the quality of my drawing. So, I have nixed this shamelessly from Wikipedia. It's the only place I could find it. But as you can see, it illustrates quite nicely. And I don't want to sound like I'm putting fact down. Because he comes up with a big blue blanket. And I'm saying, it's all these things. I'm saying, he is actually very, very bright. He's come up with a fact weave. He led VF3. He goes, goes on to amazing things. And he does come up with a big blue blanket. I'm just saying, it's an evolution based on the new existing technology, the existing maturing technologies, rather than new technologies, the maturing technologies, and the capabilities and the numbers of aircraft they have on their, uh, they have their ability to get hold of. Coming out, thus a reverse of this listening subs came in the form of the Orions and Bears dropping Sona boys, hunting subs. What comes around goes around. Yes, well, you know, hey ho. Sure, Mac, I wouldn't put it past the US and US to try to turn a sub into the AP if it goes that's what the US does. Uh actually it was the Germans who tried that with the flak submarines, and um that wasn't too successful. Seth Thompson, I do believe the CIA called an electro warfare sub the grocery getter. I wouldn't surprise be surprised at that one, and that is certainly what they are very capable of getting. Everything. Fact weave. Um, Amber Zelsi, second line. No, it is the fact weave. I have spelled it correctly. I know. Uh, sorry, it was the resolution. But as you can see, it's a very clever thing. Um, Wang Lung, thank you. But, um... Watch the language once. Well, because the reason I say that is because my little cousins watch, and they are well below 16, and I don't want them to pick up bad language, and their mums blame me. So that's why we do the, uh, we do a bit come, sometimes say, watch the language. But yes, Wang Alung just pointed out that Draken Fennell has mentioned that the solar flares marked around with radar function in Pacific during World War II period. Solar flares, magnetics, uh, you should see what those things do to sonar and to magnetic uh, magnetic torpedo heads as well. So, just fun. Hi, Dan Freeman. Uh, Force A1. The Americans also designed, but didn't build, a nuclear-powered submarine LST. Yeah... Thank you, Stafford Thompson. Uh, right. Sirimac, also the Americans tended to use fold type, uh, the types under larger categories, which often get glossed over in histories. Yes, there is 
that thing, the British tend to be slightly more honest about the fact that they are doing the batch process and they are evolving, whereas the Americans are all called this or this, and then you find down, there is an actual number, part number of it, and the part numbers of age. It's like, um, I think it was the Aegis SBY-1 of the Ticos and that has something like 16 variants which I think made, it meant that every single one had a slightly different variation on the radar because they were kept making changes in them as they were building. I mean, it's written FAC instead of FAC. Misspelling your name. Oh, fudgical. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I have no idea why that happened. But I'm going to go change that now. Literally, while I while it's here. Oh, I caramba. I got the weave right. I got the complicated word right. I don't know. I don't know. So. <laughs> hmm. Thank you for that, Alan Sasky. Right then. What, Jeff Beeler, one major difference for deck crews, hello, Jeff, is that with jets, you approach from the front, not the back of the aircraft. That is also true, but you can get sucked into things that way. For Calvin Gaswood, reflex subs. I would consider Russian to rebuild some of their old Delta SGNs uh, when they can develop on a universal VLS and pack it with Broom of Sam for Aerosol Fun Family and a data link. Uh, that would be quite scary, but also quite interesting. Anonymous, flak subs did not work in World War II. No, they didn't. They didn't. Let's put it this way. There have been many people who try with air defense, I see, with flak, uh, flak subs and various other things. And with the, the closest ones who come to it are the Russians who keep mounting, um, and the French, actually, who keep mounting surface-to-air missiles in the sails of the submarines, uh, which is... It's a methodology, but it's kind of a scare. It's kind of a thing which is going to scare helicopter pilots. But you know, if you're shooting down a helicopter which is coming in after you or a P8, you probably laced it too late. Take care, Staff Thompson. Santiago Trulio Tuban, hello. Is it possible for me to contact you on Discord? I have a detailed question about Admiral Cunningham I want to ask. Also, hello from Colombia. Well, hello to Colombia. And yes, if you go down to the bottom, you can find a link on Discord and you can send me messages on the um, server. I happily chat away. No mention of the Western Wyvern yet. It's coming up. Hello, Alex Hunt. Jeff Beeler. Fac Weave is a USN fighter technique. Uh, you certainly want. <laughs> it is. It's a good one also. It's used in, uh, as I put it, it's used from Lexington. Um, first by VF3, which Fack was the squadron commander of. And he has a job, they, they shoot down him and his uh, him and his wingman shoot down six zeros. And the uh, whole thing has actually quite between them, they shoot down six zero, zero, um, six zeros, and between the whole group of six aircraft in his flight, uh, they only lose one in the entire in the entire uh, battle, and they shoot. They account for a disproportionately large number of Japanese aircraft between them. 
So that's a really critical maneuver. But it's kind of interesting. Um, in contents of Jeff Beeler, will Michael Clapp be guessing today? No, it's going to be mostly about, the, when I'm talking Royal Navy, it's mostly going to be dealing with this gentleman, Casper John. This book. Now, the reason Casper John is mostly going to be featured, because remember, we're doing 1945 to 1960, roughly. And why I'm using the Royal Navy primarily is because the Royal Navy, it's kind of easier to see the transition because they are smaller. So the transition's more, boom, it happens. Also, they have less money if things go wrong. So they tend to be quite more careful when they're doing it. Now, if you notice, he's captain of HMS Pretoria Castle, an escort carrier, in 1944 to 5. Then he's captain of HMS Ocean, 1945 to 47. Then he's Commander HMS Fulmar, which was the Royal Navy's name for RAF Lossimuff. Then he's Deputy Chief of Naval Air Equipment, 1949. Director of Air Organization and Training, 1950. Flag Officer Third Aircraft Squadron, Heavy Squadron, Home Fleet, 1951-52. Deputy Control of Aircraft at the Ministry of Supply, 1952-4. to Flag Officer Air Home, based at HMS Daedalus. Um, Royal Naval Air Station Leon Solent, 55 to 57. Vice Chief of the Naval Staff, 1957 to 60. And First Sea Lord, 1960 to 1963. I.e., this guy's career is the period we're talking about. So, he is going to be, and surprisingly enough, he's involved in a lot of the things we get, we get to see happening. A lot of the things we get to see happening. Carl Gasbert. Fact, fun fact. While the Fact Weaver's an excellent turn and burn fighter pair maneuver, unless your opponent is a good at deflection shooting, uh, Zero is surprisingly fond of zoom boom tactics too. Yes. Anos, Heli's other main ASW platform. They are now. They weren't then. Uh, CWGN90. The two early British naval sams are quite polar opposites. Sea Slug and Sea Cat. Yes, they are. They're both quite weird as well. Hello. Hello, Nia, sir. I was asking. Also, since I've just successfully distracted Good Doc, and before I forget, does the HMS War Sprite's Swordfish U boat kill in Battle of Narvik make it the, the biggest ASW frigate ever deployed? Potentially, if you consider it, did you consider a definition of an ASW frigate to be a ship which is just sinking submarines? But seeing as she's not using a sonar to, uh, or a toad array sonar or anything like that, it's just her helicopter offering an offer, like, rather like destroyers and other ships do, uh, I would go no, but there is an argument you could make. Hello, Cadron. Sean Mack, also, we don't have to deal with the disaster that is US Air Force and USN designation systems that exist at this point. I, I, I'm i not mentioning that. Um, I, actually, what I, the other reason I do the Royal Navy is because it allows me to drop into the Australian Navy, the US Navy, and various other navies as I wish, but I can avoid certain other political disputes going on at the time. Anyway. So, Casper John is the really important person when it comes to the development of naval aviation in this period. Casper John is the one pushing the Royal Navy forward. He, in many ways, steps into the Henderson role for the post-World War II Royal Navy, in that with Henderson having not survived, Casper John had been one of the ones who Henderson had been training up where in the interwar period had sponsored his career and so casper comes through at this point and one of the interesting things is that some uh, certain points in casper's career he will pick up <clears throat> other young officers as they're coming and help them go up through the service one of the officers he promotes shamelessly throughout his service is a guy called winkle brown Another one he picks up at the end is a guy called uh, Michael Clapp. And so you can start to see a sort of group of officers coming through. And when you 
go through, you can carry this on, you can find other certain senior officers where they pop up in the Royal Navy even to this day. So, Casper John is kind of critical. He is one of the ones who goes and makes the case whenever, and you can see this potentially what's going on. If you look at his years, yeah, did him. Uh, especially, you know, in his Whitehall jobs, the reason he's being called to Whitehall is to make the case for naval aviation and make it firmly. So he's making it in 1949. He's doing it in 1950. He's technically on flag officer duties, but he can also wander back to Whitehall then. And then he's back in Whitehall again, and then he has to go up and sort out an airbase, which needs a lot of work. But again, he's able to easily get to Whitehall from there. And then he's in Whitehall, and then he's in Whitehall. So he is spending a rather large part of his life, so of this period, to... Three, four, five, six. Basically, from 49 to 63, he's either in Whitehall or very close to Whitehall to try and make the case for naval aviation. And that is his role in the Navy. And he is steelily determined. And there is a classic joke from him, uh, from him when a, um, the Prime Minister at the time said, after he finished meeting, well, you've convinced me. Uh, da, 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 da. What's your next meeting? Leader of the opposition, sir. Um, Prime Minister. What? Why are you going to talk to him? Because I've convinced you, Prime Minister, but now I have to convince him to make sure it's, uh, it sticks. He was absolutely... would do what was necessary. Did services aid the camp of the king, all sorts of things. Very, very good at, at the politics. Jeff Hiller, I have noticed that post-war the RN does not lay down a big ship until the Invincibles and Albion and Bulwark. So in this period, in this period, it's adapting World War II hulls for post-war needs, effective or not. The thing is, a it has a lot of uh, it has a lot of World War II hulls on the slipway to build up from, and we'll be getting into this. So it's honestly it's cheaper, and they're already being um, allowed by the government, so they don't have to go and argue for them. Secondly, they do a lot of conversions. Thirdly, and this is the thing, there's also Fearless and Intrepid, which get laid down, um, and some quite big destroyers, but honestly, uh, CVA-01 would have been useful. CVA-01 was about the right time we needed to really support British ship and industry and keep maintain and not have to do what we did to build the Queen Elizabeth class. Honestly, if one of the interesting things is we'd have still had to build the Queen Elizabeth class, the current ones, because of the CVA-01s when they'd have gone out of service. But if we built them, we'd probably be looking at, a, at the, because of the maintenance of the large building facilities, we would probably have been cutting the cost of the Queen Elizabeth class by about 30 to 40 percent overall. I, and, or, and that's, not in, that's not including the fact that we actually did the thing of, because we paid them to not build them, basically, but keep the people working there and keep their skills up, we basically did buy free, pay, pay, the, pay for free and buy two. Which is not, you're, you're, you're supposed to buy two, get the third free. You're not supposed to pay for free and get two, but that's what we did. That's why the Queen Elizabeth class seems so expensive. And don't get me started on the daring class. Dirt Squad. The Japanese had developed a counter the fact weave by Santa Cruz. However, as they lost experienced pilots and their institutional knowledge wasn't passed on, they lost it. Yes. I thank you. And yeah. As I said, it, it, they lose the international knowledge. They, because they're not doing that cycle system. You need to do a cycle system where you bring back those people as instructors. It's critical. And test pilots to refine your aircraft design. You think about the British development of aircraft in this period. Who's running the development of aircraft for the Royal Navy? Oh, a guy called Winkle Brown, who is one of the foremost test pilots of World War II, is put in charge and pretty much running the development of naval aviation of the aircraft by this guy. So basically, Casper John goes, I will get you the money and provide and make the case for it. You have to go and get me the best aircraft you can get me. 
Yes, sir. So it's cat away Uncle Brown, and off he goes. It works. Mm hmm. But come here. If we tell the Yanks War Spider to say a soda frigate, then it might give them pause of thought if that's. <laughs> yeah, it could have been fun, that one. All right then. Also, on the Iron Designs, no shortage of large hulls in the period. They just don't get built. Uh, yeah, that's bothering. They do have a lot of them. Uh, and honest, because of the Treaty of Montreux, uh, there are limits on warships traveling through Bo uh, Bosphorus. Yes. Well, also, that's why all Russian ships were called cruisers. They're uh, large anti-submarine aviation cruisers is what their Kievs were designated as, I think. I seem to remember that one. Hello, old Richard. Peter Dawson, Kiev was design, uh, partly designed for ASW, same as the British Free Deck Cruisers, aka the Invincible class. The latter was a replacement for the Tigers and four Sea King helicopters. Yes, officially. It might have been a certain gentleman who we just lost a picture of who came up with that idea. Alex Hunt, the decision to not build CVA1 was fairly insane. Agreed. Nick Ashall Rice, Queen Elizabeth class isn't really that even even really that expensive when you compare it to the cost of a Flight Zero America class. Yeah, they aren't. They are very very good, but they aren't that expensive. But you realise that there is a lot of expense in them because of the infrastructure that had to be built to support them, and because of paying not to build them. New, new house ass. Oh, it perks up. Oh, are we talking about manufacturing learning curves? Yes. Dev Squad. Sounds a bit like the US Army keeping building M1 Abrams that they don't need to ensure General Electric don't destroy the jigs and sack the workers. Pretty much, you just keep some production going through. Force A1. CVA was unaffordable. The RAF never got a strike force. Position the shift of rolled nuclear deterrence to Royal Navy submarines being made a few years before CVA1 was cancelled. The thing is, CVA1 wasn't unaffordable. That is one of the things often pointed at it, but it wasn't. Um, what was... It was at the point at which it was still viable to build. There is a study which later on says it was unaffordable, but that study's done years... Uh, done a few years later when they're talking about whether or not to ca uh, whether or not they can actually replace um, Hermes Eagle and Ark Royal, and they're saying actually we can't build the carrier anymore. Even CVA one would have been more too expensive because the infrastructure is gone. When CVA one is designed and built, there is still the infrastructure there to build it. Yes, it would have been. Uh, it's when you start to work out the cost through the process. There is the actual physical cost, okay, that's some, but there's also the amount of money it ripples through the economy for, and Treasury do both sums. And one of the interesting things is CVA1 is cancelled, but the Treasury actually report was that was the better financial investment for the UK for the UK's internal economy, but the, uh, the agreement was the Foreign Office and the Prime Minister's Office, the Cabinet Office, believed that the Ministry of Defence It'd be better putting that money into the RAF strike force, which of course was then cancelled as well. So you know, it's 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 a fun, complicated scenario, scenario of everyone getting their basically their ideas wrong. Right, tactics. At this stage in development of naval aviation, the accent was still on, seen to be on air superiority. It was deemed essential that Navy should be a, have aircraft faster, or at least as fast. 
As any enemy aircraft which might be encountered, the gun was still the only weapon for use against other aircraft, and not until the air-to-air -air missile became a reliable weapon would the need for performance superiority give way to the concept that was really needed was an aircraft that was a good weapons platform with both adequate radar and payload. Indeed, the comparative merits of air superiority versus weapon-carrying uh, aircraft is still argued today, and I would agree with Mr. Wetton on that one. Um... Interesting thing about Desmond Wetton's book is I seem to be magically able to uh, lose it every time I want to uh, flick onto it and use it. Um, I'm not sure how this happens, but I use it, do the writing, and then I cannot find it for the life of me. Ah, oh, well. So, here is an interesting discussion between Sir John Cunningham, who's the, of course, the first Lord who takes over after Alan Cunningham, uh, Andrew Cunningham. Um, the Minister of Portfolio questioned the need for a Pacific fleet of the size contemplated, having regard to the fact that the friendly power and a not potential enemy now dominated the ocean. Shigon Gunningham pointed out that although there might be no potential enemy battle fleet, there were plenty of potentially hostile submarines and a vast area, uh, which, in, uh, which there were many very important British interests. Now, pretty much the tactics at this point are World War II's continued, okay? This is the period between 1945 to 1950. And everyone's still getting over World War II to an extent. They're also doing a lot of technological development at the time. You must remember at this point, and I'll be talking about it later... Jet aircraft are just making their first landings on carriers. They're working out how they're going to deal with their higher approach speeds. They're working out how they're going to deal with them. There are things which need to be developed to make aircraft jets really carrier capable. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. There are also attempts to make twin-engined aircraft for carry operation. There's the lovely Sea Hornet. And various other things going into this at this point. So there is a lot of technological evolution going on, but no one really has the stomach for making large orders or placing large orders of innovative aircraft or doing massive changes to carriers. They just want a bit of peace to cycle the fleet through and calm the fleet down. Because you've got a lot of wear and tear, you've got to work out which ships are going to be viable for the next few years, which ships are going to get rid of, what you're going to do with the battle fleet, what you're going to do with the battleships, what you're going to do with the cruisers, what you're going to do with the destroyers, all these things. There is so much going on, taking, uh, turning the fleet over from World War II and calming it down after six years of solid fighting. It's 1939 to 1945. So yes, it's only, it's not actually a full six years, but it's close enough to that. It's solid fighting. The Royal Navy needs to calm down. And remember, again, it's not just nineteen. It's not just ninety September nineteen thirty nine. War begins. Da, da 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 da. They have been. They had been on constant acceleration from about nineteen thirty seven onwards, and revving the fleet up. They needed time to relax. They needed time to. Okay, yes, they're watching the Soviet Union, they're watching these, but they need time to consolidate and start synthesizing the lessons because they've been on a constant churn, a constant move, 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 move because of war, a constant adapt, react, and re adapt to their reaction constantly through the war, a constant technological and a cycle where the enemy has a constant vote. They needed to calm it down for a bit. They needed to basically stabilize themselves. So this is this is affects what we're building. This is why you're building you get you you're having the firebrand coming in because yes, it's a single seat torpedo bomber. It's kind of like a high powered version of a sock with cuckoo. It uses all the technology available and it looks good on paper because let's be honest, there aren't missiles or anything else at the moment that I can sink ships as well as that can. Um and a torpedo is a fairly good method of sinking ships. And you've seen what they did at Taranto. You've seen what they've done at countless naval battles. You might as well have it. 
Ian Carl, Firebrand does not does look more of the streamlined than the swordfish. Yes, it was. Right. <clears throat> Anonymous, telling a pilot not to... Uh, a good way of stop, if they are stopping a group you've trained to be aggressive, not to use it. But probably partially because of the reports of getting pilots shot down. Depth score to Sean Mack. What was the question? Sean Mack put... Ah. Yeah. That's a discussion the fact we've... Right, Owen Moss, telling a pilot not to... Also, which pilot perfected the airdrop torpedo? Air-to-air air torpedo. <laughs> uh, that would have been a fun one. Dan Freeman, is this where we talk about the sunk cost fallacy or not? Oh, we're not going to get into that one. Inca. Bristol Centurus wasn't enough of a priority during the war. Later World War II aircraft could have usefully fitted it and used their power. Oh, yes, they could have. Bristol Centurus would have been incredibly useful. Colin Zad, hello. Have we discussed the Worcester class of AAA cruisers yet? No. It's the jet agent moment. The Worcester class AAA cruisers will probably be in the cruisers not built. The dream cruisers. Um, I didn't think it was going to fit in really today. But I'm, that's coming up in December. Warren Swain. Hello. Since you've mentioned HMS Daedalus, a tour of FAA shore bases might be in order sometime. My school was named after HMS Siskin, former RAF Gosport. My dad was on Censure and Victorious. Cool, and that might be something fun to go through, because there are a fair number of FAA bases, because they have to. It's one of the interesting things that the reason the Royal Navy expands so much greater in World War II than it does in World War I is because you have the fleet air arm go so massive, you have the Royal Marines go quite so large, and you have to have quite such a larger escort force and quite such a larger fleet. And also, you're maintaining fleets in so many different parts of the world. In Model 1, the Royal Navy is incredibly concentrated in the, in the North Sea, in the North Atlantic. In World War II, it's fighting in the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific. It's fighting across the whole world at the same time. That's not going to entertain a small fleet. And then you need all these land bases to support the fleet air arm all over the world. You need all sorts of things around the world to support them as infrastructure bases and ports. And it's just, yeah. Force A1. Um, the Handley Page Victor, and it's not just it's not just the Victor, it's also the Vulcan and oh, what's the other part of the V-Force? Anyway, the this the full V-Force. It's uh, I have nothing against the V-Force. This is the thing. I actually think they were pretty essential for their time, and I do agree. I uh, disagree when it's set up as your choices between your heavy bomber aircraft, or your carrier battle group, because I think you need both at that time, definitely, because that is your long-range strike. Uh, one is your long-range independent strike from the UK. One is your global reach. The whole thing is the... they the My problem with the CBA-1 decision is because they make it based on the idea of a retreat, uh, of withdrawal from East of Suez, and we never actually withdraw. They just say that on... They just say that so they can justify it. Which is silly. Jeff Fima. Post-war, due to lack of grumblings, do you see a shift from bombs and torpedoes to bombs and rockets for strike missions? With Firefly becoming the strike workhorse. To an extent, you do, but... Honestly, there are quite a few aircraft going on. And you must remember that air groups are cycling fast. There's a reason why I haven't done, really, a post-war air group. At this point. Because... It's cycling quite so fast. And uh, you have firebrands, you have furies, you have all sorts of things coming in and taking over. And it's it's just constant, really. God, the chat's moving quickly this evening. Having fun trying to keep up with it. Uh, 401. The initial plans for future Royal Navy strike aircraft in the 1960s were OR-346. 
thing in terms of maritime TSR2 in terms of... Oof. Citroen, uh, Jeff Beeler, both the RN and ESN were moving away from Torpedo's primary anti ship weapon near the end of war. Yeah. I'd agree with that. But there again, both were also still considering the torpedo, but they didn't really need it towards the end of World War II, but they were thinking about it when they were looking at the Soviets. So you went, old enough to watch Le, Le Mor, as Le Mans and Naval Air Station was expanded. Match that Moav test planes over the mountain. We had constant sonic boom in the 50s. <sighs> Fun times. Right. Modern Doc. If CV1 wasn't cancelled, UK would probably procure US designs, F-18 sector, as we did the F... Made them slower than the US uh, versions due to fitting a Royal Royce Avrons. Uh, probably not. Well... F4, definitely. Buccaneer would have kept going for quite a while. Would we have got the F-18? Potentially, but potentially we'd have waited for the Super Hornet. So we more likely would have been the Super Hornet, which would have been coming. Interesting thing would have been what we'd have done for a airborne early warning, whether we'd have gone for the Hawkeye or we'd have gone our own way. Probably would end up going for the Hawkeye. Ben Nora, I have to say, discussing the Iron in the 50s and 60s gets me in a similar mood as discussing post Julian the uh, apostate Western Roman Empire. Fun times then. Jeff, how did the Korean War influence tactics since it was air superiority in Ground Strike War? Jeff, I think I've answered your point. I'm going into it in a whole chat in a whole cha chapter of video of um, slides. Valiant, thank you for reminding me what the third of the V Force was. Mm. I would argue, Citroen 90, that whilst you can't use the V-Force to retake the Falklands, if you'd had a carrier battle group, the odds are that I don't think the Argentines would have probably invaded the Falklands if you'd had a work fully worked up carrier battle group as they understood it to be, because everyone understood that the American-style carrier group was the only way to work things. The difference is the British found a different way to work it, and it worked well. It did manage to work viably enough for the operation. Not great. It could have done with airborne early warning and various other things, but we won't get into that. That's a bit after this point. But the thing is, you still need the heavy bomber force, because you need the heavy bomber force to fret uh, to, as a counter to the Russians. Until you have the Strategic nuclear deterrent is in the SSBNs. You need the heavy bomber force. You either have one or the other in terms of that reach. But I would still argue that I wouldn't say no. You know, there's, there's a reason the B-52s are still around. And frankly, if we'd had a workhorse heavy bomber like a B-52, I wouldn't be surprised if that would be still in service with Britain because it's useful to have that kind of long-range heavy strike. Gemma, main problem with the Soviet copying Western tech was political. So was... The Soviet Union, the, ja the Chinese, all these things have their own ideas. Yes, sometimes their aircraft do look very similar, but that doesn't mean they're copying. It might mean that they're getting similar results from the wind tunnel or the other tests when they're looking for a similar solution, a similar problem. Because that, I bring up the Worcester as they were built specifically for the AAA role, which they were never used in. Uh, so many weren't. <laughs> Basically, I have slides like this so I can catch up on the live chat. F4 Phantoms had Rolls-Royce Spays, which were very good. Yeah. They were. They were a good engine. Hmm. Oh, 
the Russians also have two nuclear reactors because of the way they design some of their submarines. Basically, it's the Russians' insurance against not things failing, but about maintaining balance, uh, maintaining the power they need for high speed, but also it, it's about giving themselves options. Should one go wrong, they can use the other one to force coolant and things into the uh, into the one going wrong. It, it's basically it, it's a it's a backup system. Very sensible, actually, in some respects. Doesn't put all the eggs in one basket. In car, I was on board Atrus Eagle during 1966 as a kid off Aden. The aircraft outfit, Blackburn, Blackenier, uh, 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 the Havilland Sea Vixen, and Submarine Scimitar, tankers, and Ferry Gannets. Yep. Also, on F4 was procured under prior to cancellation of CVA1. The F18 might not or may not exist in the world where the CVA1, given the point of departure, is well before a USN requirement for a lightweight fighter. Uh, I would say, in the nicest way, I think the people who came up with the F18 and the reasons they came up with the F18 would still exist. Would have still existed. So this is off topic, but it's still about jet relation. The the reason the F eighteen is up is similar grounds as the reason the F sixteen is up. You need something to try and bring the cost down and to fill a lot of roles and a lot of strike roles and take up a lot of flying hours. As I said, I reckon it's the Super Hornet more likely that the British would have ended up with of the Hornet family. I don't think they would have got the F fourteen. If they had, it would have been a joint buy with the RAF to do the same roles as Tornado ADV does. But the reason the British go into the Tornado ADV is because that's for um, keeping the European arms industry going and fireballs so that if they need it, they can churn things out quickly in the event of a major war. Show 190. Uh... No, I'm not sure I would say got lucky with the Falklands. There's a lot of reasons why the British were in the Falklands. It's not there's luck as much. There is luck involved in all war, but there's not as much luck as sometimes people like to go on about the Falklands. Hello, Carl Harman. I'm doing well. Alexander, I wonder if the Rotodynes could have been improved the useful AEW platform. Oh, I hope not. I hope not. That's God. Form is largely dictated by function. There is usually a form that will be most efficient in a role and will be used. Pretty much. Jimmy. Well, industrial spying was more in uh, more mundane, more in more mundane and small stuff. Electronics produced uh, machines. Act. Main shape was different, and West had mania of looking at Soviet stuff like they looked at Zero. Yes, there is so much of that, and it still goes on to this day. In car. Reviewing 1960s R and jet aircraft now, none were very well thought of. Buccaneer underpads, Sea Vixen, Simdol's death traps. Yeah. Depends on who you're talking to about them. Most of the air group, uh, most of the pilots I know were quite, very, very, uh, quite happy with them and liked them a lot. Buccaneer S1 was underpowered. Buccaneer S2 was certainly not. And it wasn't that underpowered. It just, they wanted slightly more speed. And it's only, uh, it's again, you have to remember what was the Buccaneer's role and what it was designed for. And that explains its power functions. Also, say one. There were naval staff air requirements for carrier-based AW and COD aircraft, Hawker, Sidley, and Avac, several designs. Uh, yeah, for those wondering, The Admiralty and AW, written by Chris Gibson. Yes, I have that book somewhere. It's a good book. Mostly.
Car Harmon, that's cool. You're 19 and you've uh, moved 25 meters of book and sorted them alphabetically. That is good. New Hazard S. I don't think a thing that the UK could have done in the 1960s and 70s would have made a lick of difference for the US Navy and the US Air Force development plans. I doubt it would either. I would... Uh, they were planning on three or four. I think the main interesting thing if they had done is if they would started going joint programs earlier. If the F-18, let's say, had turned into a joint Anglo-American project aircraft for a carrier design or something like that, that could have been something different. That could have had an impact. Because whilst, yes, the Americans would have been the lead in it, I think one of the interesting things is if the British do get the CVO-1s, what does that impact on terms of the Australians and the Canadians on the decisions they make with their carrier programs? It's kind of interesting to think about that. A CBA one was not going to be one or two carriers. It was going to be three or four was the plans for it. Uh, it was going to be ordered in two batches of two. Uh, well, actually, how do I put it? They originally were talking about six, so I'm cutting it down to four. Right, then. so the carriers available in 1950 for the Korean War. You mostly have. Well, the Colossus class and the Majestic class are the ones which are officially available. You'll notice that only six out of ten, uh, six of ten Colossus class actually go and serve in the Royal Navy. Two of them, Pioneer and Perseus, are consistent are complete as maintenance carriers. It's fun times. Uh, two of these, uh, I think it's Ocean and Triumph, will take part in the Suez Crisis two years later as the as the amphibious assault ships, the sort of LPH role. But these are the ships which are going to be a part of the Korean War effort. The Royal Navy is also building Majestic class, which are an evolution of the Colossus class. And they're all get, they're all sold off. So they go to the Royal Australian Navy, has Melbourne and Sydney, Canadian Navy as Magnificent Bonaventure, and well, you know, Indian Navy as a Vikrant. Uh, Leviathan scrap before completion. And, you know, it's a fun thing. It's a fun naval force. They're fully capable. They're very good. Those are good sh carriers. They're the light fleet carriers, and they are very quali they're a quality design. But they are a quality World War II emergency design. And this is the fun thing about them. They're the 1942 design light fleet carriers. As you know, I've pointed out many times, they are... Based humongously on HMS Unicorn's design. Their standard displacement is 13,200 tons as designed, and their full load as designed is 18,000 tons. So they are really, really, really ditchy. Most of their time in service, their maximum air group is some region of 40 aircraft. That's the same with the ones we'll be talking about next, the Central class, um, who have a slightly higher tonnage. But, you know, 
they are good ships. They are reliable ships. Why does the Royal Navy build them? Well, let's consider. Most of them can keep using them. Colossus is laid down in 1942. She's commissioned in 44. Glory, laid down in 42, commissioned in 45. Ocean, laid down in 42, commissioned in 45. Venerable, laid down in 42, commissioned in 45. Vengeance, laid down in 42, commissioned in 45. Becomes uh, HMAS Vengeance in 1952. Pioneer completed as a maintenance carrier and comes into service in 1945. Warrior comes into service in 1945. Almost pretty much immediately is transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy. Theseus laid down 43, commissioned 1946. Triumph laid down 43, commissioned 1946. Perseus laid down 43, commissioned 1945. Majestics laid down uh, Majestic laid down 43, commissioned 50, 1955. Terrible laid down 1943, commissioned 1948. Magnificent laid down 43, commissioned 1948. Hercules laid down 1943, commissioned 1961. Powerful, laid down 43, commissioned 1957. These ships are new ships. Yes! Earlier, there was a very good comment made that the Royal Navy wasn't building new ships. Well, you don't need to build new ships. These are new ships when they enter service. You don't, you know, it, it's kind of like going, right then, you don't need, you're not fighting a massive war anymore. We're not going to pay to complete these ships, but we're going to pay enough to keep them Say it well looked after, well catered for on the slipways, and then we will build, finish them and build them when we need them. And that makes sense. In car, RN had many carrier hulls until mid sixties. Ark Royal, Eagle, Albion, Bulwark, Theseus, Hermes. Yes, they had lots of them. And Tim Kofer, the Buccaneer was probably the best strike aircraft of its time. The all weather of the nature of the A six was its only advantage over the Buccaneer. And the the Buccaneer S two was all weather. The S one I think was all weather as well. Yeah, it was night capable. Yeah, it was all weather. I think I think they're both all weather. I'm just trying to remember my chats with Michael Clapp, because he used the one who flew in them. I have got a big book on Buccaneers somewhere around me. Ah, oh, there, yeah. Kahaman, do you think it's possible the RN could get another class of ship as well as Type 32? You never know. It depends on what the global situation is. Nick, Nick, Nick Ashwell Rice, Shane Vickers didn't build a later light fleet carrier, the Mini Invincible with a container aft flight deck. In car, existing World War II RN carriers were limited by the height of hangars. The increasing size of weight aircraft. Did this apply to Enterprise and SS class carriers? Yes. All of them have to be either dramatically uh, dramatically rebuilt. There is a reason why they all go through massive rebuilds. There is a reason why HMS Victorious has the rebuild she does. The USN had the massive rebuilds they do as well. Your oh yes, we're putting it, we're doing this massive rebuild because for jets we need to put in a angled flight deck. Also rebuilding the hangars. Carl Gasman, one can joke about a buccaneer. That's not really a ground attack, only a ground attack, but a ground effect to a craft. Eh, well, they do fly low enough. Hello, Lionheart X ray.
Jamath, not bad for ships built to supposedly to merchant uh, service centers against RN built centers. They are built to merchant service plus standards, I would say. They have RN standards where RN standards are required, and they have merchant standards where merchant standards can make things easier but not affect things too much. There's God. The A6 having a side by side cockpit is a big help for his aircraft. Oh, we agreed. It is a big help. Gahaman, do you still take viewer video suggestions? Yes, I do. I always do. But um, the thing is, I note them down on my little paper, on my, on my folder, and I try and get them through. I have a whole spreadsheet for this all stuff. Right. Oh, I've gone through a bottle of iron brew quickly. I'm back in a second. I'm gonna see if I've got more in the store. Dang it. None in the store. That's annoying. Uh, right then, let's see. What questions are we to? Hmm. <laughs> can we get a car? Can we get a video of tanks? I don't mind what, uh, what surprised me, but tanks, please. Um, actually, think about that. Well, just before I get this, but I have been considering doing something on our previous tanks. Uh, Kyandra, how many of those do you drink each day? Um, I try not to drink more than two liters a day unless it's a really, really bad day. What exactly does Iron Brew taste like? Uh, that is something which is undescribable, really. I thought I had another bottle of Iron Brew. It seems to have disappeared. So, yeah, that was my empty one. I'll, I'll have to go buy some more tomorrow. Well. I'll buy some more on Thursday, which is payday. So I'll have to take a day off of Iron Brew tomorrow. That's going to be tough. Uh, Dirt Squad, is your viewer suggestion follow beginning to go away with Drax yet? I have managed to keep a little bit more control of it, but that's literally because I'm doing two a month. And because I'm making you all vote to pick which two. So that, that, that that's the whole thing. The patron one, I honestly, I, I, I have to admit, I hold my hand up, I'm cheating with that, in that I make my viewers, my viewers vote, uh, the patrons vote for which of their suggestions get done each month. So I, I can keep the fold that way. But my other folder, which is my folder, a list of ideas I like but don't get through to vote, that is, that is an Excel spreadsheet with already 120 entries in it. So I can, I'll be making videos for a long time. 
Ian Carr, in light of experience with light carriers, should present day ships be built to enable merchant navy standards? Um, we do sometimes. There is a lot of combining of the two skills on two sets. It depends, though, on what you're designing your carrier to. Must remember, light fleet carriers were designed with the idea that if they did take damage, you'd have enough of them coming through. You wouldn't have to worry about it so much. Uh, we don't have that production line anymore, so you actually have to... You end up having to build to naval standards because you're not building as many, so that makes their ships actually more expensive because you don't have the replacements. <sighs> right. Did the FAA have preferred manufacturers, Sejan? Uh, well, as you can see, this is the air groups going into the Korean War. You have the Supermarine Seafire Mark 47, the Fairy Firefly, um, Hawker Sea Fury, from memory. Yep, Hawker Sea Fury. And, well, an AD-4 Skyraider. So why is the AD-4 Skyraider in the picture for the Royal Navy in the Korean War? Because the Royal Navy starts testing them during the Korean War. They start playing around with the AD-4 Skyraider. And the AD-4 Skyraider will fulfill a very specific role in the Royal Navy, which I'll get to. But what are these air groups doing? Well, you have the Fairly Firefly, which is actually taking part in a lot of the ground pounding missions in the in the Korean War. They're doing a lot of the attack runs, a lot of the long range reconnaissance runs, a lot of the anti submarine warfare patrols. They are involved in a lot of in a lot of things. They are getting involved in. So that's an incredibly useful aircraft. And it's on pretty much every carrier. In fact, it is on every carrier that goes into the Korean War. On the first carrier, which turns up in the Korean War, it has Supermarine Seafires. And theoretically, it takes them home. But they actually do appear and wander around at various other points they appear. The Sea Fury is, of course, the aircraft which shoots down, some, uh, shoots down at least one jet. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it has fun. And um, it's a good what a thing. Um, right, they're a very very good thing, and I have actually somewhere here. I have the story of it of Sea Fury written in front of me. Because a long while ago, I published an article called Peaking Obsolescence or Forgotten Innovation. There is a link down below in the descriptions on global maritime history. And... Well, you know. In between 1945 and 1937, when the, actually the Western Waven retired, uh, the fleet air arm took delivery of Hawker Sea Furies, twin-engine de Havilland Sea Hornets, and the Wyvern. So they had lots of fighters. Furthermore, the Sea Fire and the Fury Fairy Firefly, their hangouts were also there. There was also the Fire Brand. So they had lots of aircraft available. And it did, did, did. The Sea Fury, an aircraft which was designed to see ex uh, destined to see extensive service during its career and was the last piston engine fighter in service of the Fleet Air Arm First Line Squadrons, um, was an aircraft which had Second World War origins, uh, World War origins as uh, obviously it would, as well as post war analysis. A prototype had been flown in February 1945. Uh, it's kind of the progenitor of the modern for, uh, joint for, for F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, as it was designed in two versions. One, simply called Fury, meant to enter service of the Royal Air Force to replace the Tempest in service, and probably the Typhoon as well, and the Sea Fury for the Fleet Air Arm. 
The Fury was cancelled, though, because the RAF had enough war legacy aircraft to see it through until the jet age came back properly. But the Sea Fury wasn't, because the Royal Navy really needed a fast fighter. And it was one of the fastest piston-engine aircraft ever produced. The FB-2 had a top speed of 460 miles per hour at 18,000 feet and a range of 700 miles at 30,000 feet. It was a fighter, though, not a torpedo fighter like the Firebrand. It could carry bombs. Most importantly, though, it was rugged, reliable, and a workhorse. Due to all this, it became the foundation from which would build a future, providing the, R the fleet air arm with four frontline squadrons, 801, 802, 804, and 807, and a benchmark by which other all subsequent aircraft would be compared. It did this whilst also being enough of a capability that it would be justified a capability's retention in rounds of post-war budget reductions. In comparison, the Hallant Sea Hornet was, well, something the RN was leeching for, but actually just didn't work. Basically, the RN's preferred manufacturers pre-World War II were Blackburn and Ferry and Supermarine. And post-World War II are Supermarine, Hawker and Ferry. And Blackburn. Iron Hard X-ray. 84. You name it, it can carry it. <laughs> it can carry it. Yep. In car, no fleet air arm jets in the Korean War. No. In fact, the first uh, really fleet air arm jet to enter service. Doesn't really well. Let's see the super. It's just, uh, yeah, the Supermarine attacker enters service in 1951, broadly speaking, and that's really the first one to join the Royal Navy. And it's August 1951, and it doesn't. It just misses out on the Korean War. So there just isn't one in time for there. And also, let's be honest, the Supermarine Attacker was not the really the best aircraft. Um, let's see, Sea Vampires, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so the Sea Vampire, uh, the RN, and I'll be getting this, does some early testing in 1948. But that's the first scene I made in flight. A pair of prototypes are followed by 18 production aircraft. They are always in 700 unit squadrons, which means they are not combat squadrons. 700 unit squadrons are testing squadrons and development squadrons. They are more for training and development than actual combat capability. First attack squadrons are the supermarine, attack, uh, supermarine attackers, and they're far too late. Car Harman, that sounds inter interesting. Uh, wouldn't mind the, ne the next, I'll beg you for a tank build from. <laughs> tank build from could be interesting. Uh, Concept, well, why not do a special on LSTs? That'll cover the tank request. I've already done some stuff on LSTs on landing craft. Um, a whole set of videos on them. I am considering going back and adding to those, but there is a whole set of videos out there already. Usually I like to jump into new topics before I go back and repeat old topics and, you know, improve them. Hello, Ron Warwick.
<laughs> Comes out. Is it me or does that look like that CFAR has two sets of propellers? It does. It has a contra-rotating uh, contra propeller. System. Yeah, the Mark 47 CFAR is an interesting thing. It has contra-rotating propellers. So, it's a cool aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. Constant, Seafire is therefore the ultimate version of Spitfire. It, honestly, it's the ultimate version of the Spitfire equivalent is also the ultimate version of Spitfire, so they're both there as really high quality units. Team like Corsairs still used by USN in Korea? Yes, they were. You know, no, there was a version called the Spitefall and Seafang that were never put into production that were arguably the best version of the Spitfire. I'm not sure, because a lot of the Seafang stuff goes into the Seafire uh, C, uh, C Mark 47. So, yeah. And those are technically supposed to be new aircraft. Warren Swain, Supermarine with Vickers is just branding. Well, they were taken over by Vickers, yes, so they did have a consolidation going on there. But that's mainly because Supermarine were very good at designing aircraft, not very good at running the production of them. Peter Ellison, ultimate version of Spitfire was the Spiteful, which had different wing with inward folding undercarriage. Mm, it's an offshoot. Hmm. You know this, as they saw the Jet Age coming, there are a bunch of major programs on the book, like the Wervan, so they went with a cheaper version of Spitfire and not the expensive one. Hmm, they had lots and lots of different things coming through. Ben Lawrence, since you started talking about the <coughs> FR-47, I have decided to take it out for a spin in War Thunder. Cool, you'll enjoy it. Concept. My grandfather went to work for Chance Vort, who built the Corsa after he got out of the Marines in World War II. It's the only reason I know about it. Hmm. It's a cool reason to know about it. Brent Polos. Were British aircraft depend on American jets for aircraft? No. The Sea Furies did a very good job of keeping off the um, jet for enemy jets. And honestly, the... You always have to remember to do an intercept you need a success you need an operating air defense radar. And they do quite well at dealing with them. The British jet aircraft do very well in terms of surviving the Korean War. They suffer losses, but again, it's it's not a massive amounts of losses. And American jets from their carriers aren't really operating a peak efficiency. Uh, how do I put this? So Yes, you're operating jets from your carrier, but actually getting the best out of the jets and getting the cycling of the air group operations is quite difficult. They're still working out how to do that. So the British are taking slightly longer to get into jets, testing out things like rubberized flight decks and all sorts of weird things, including the idea of landing without actually having undercarriage, which is a fun one, which if you look at a, if you read Winkle Brown's book is a really fun experience. I think not. Um, but what they're doing is the actual, it, it's one of the things, I think the stat from memory is that over the aircraft types, if you go down to the individual aircraft, on average, the propeller rotor, uh, the uh, propeller powered propeller in the ones which are propel uh, aircraft with propellers conduct two uh, two point four or two point five flights for every one conducted by a jet aircraft. So if you have the jet aircraft versus the 
the propeller aircraft would on average do about double the number of flights the jet one does because of the level of maintenance required to keep them going and all these things. So the Americans are sending jets, which is lovely. And they're engaging the Soviet, uh, the communist jets, and they're fighting. That's lovely. But honestly, on both sides, the jets, they are getting... It's kind of like the Spitfire and the Hurricane in the, in the Battle of Britain. In that, the jets get all the attention. Everyone's going, ooh, there are jets fighting. Ooh, it's really cool. And then you're going, well, hang on, they're completely outnumbered, and these things are doing all the actual work. But no, we have jets! It, it, it's kind of like every movie ever made, in that they focus on the really exciting small part of a, a battle and they miss out all the rest of it going on. Hmm. Concept only for there were no American jets for the Falklands. They were mainly using how do I put us in the Falklands? They were ma uh, they were mainly beating up American jets because it was most of the Ashley Air Force was American. There was a few French. Let's see. Warren Swain still think the Seahawk is the most beautiful aircraft ever designed. We'll get to her shortly. You'll be able to have a look at her. I quite like the Sea Venom. My favourite's the Sea Vixen, though. Dirt Squad top turning people to look up the BB. It's cruel. Sure, Matt. I'd just like to say this history is totally wrong. The Spitfire Mark 24 and naval variants were developed to deliver stuff to the... Uh... Hmm. Uh, Ian Carr, when MiG-15 was encountered, US Air Force had to send for Super Saber, which to that time had not been committed. Mm. I'm saying the Sea Vixen, lots of the can uh, canopy ruined it for me. See, that makes it cool for me because it's just so it's just so unique. Turning three four three. What is the Jet Age version of the Blackburn Blackburn? Honestly, if I was going for a Jet Age version of Blackburn Blackburn, it would probably be... Oof. We'll get to it in a bit shortly. All right, so, the tactics going on. Well, here's the thing. Remember I was talking about someone earlier called Casper John. Like fleet carriers, Triumph, Theseus, Glory, and Ocean were at war in Korean waters with outdated piston engine aircraft expected to battle the new menace of communist jet engine aircraft. And despite the fact they did well, he was using this heavily to get his uh, getting things going on. In 1948, when he were, uh, 1945, when he was captain of HMS Ocean, he managed to get it all set up. So the Lieutenant Commander Eric Michael Brown had done the first landing and takeoff of a jet plane ever on an aircraft carrier. It was lovely. But the trouble is, is actually getting into service. Because, yes, we want jets. Yes, we need jets. Yes, we need the range jets are going, the speed they're offering, the capabilities in terms of weapons load they can carry, the efficiency of the jet system versus the piston aircraft. However, 
To get it into service properly, you need an angled flight deck because they're higher approaching speeds. You don't want to have them lining up on the um, island because they can shoot straight into your aircraft park and into your island and cause tremendous amount of damage. No amount of armoring the stern of the island will protect against. They have, you therefore, if you've got them coming in angle, you need, and they're coming at high speed, you need to develop a mirrored landing site. They do try out with rubberized decks, which are also fun, but let's be honest, thankfully no one goes on them. And they're also starting to have a problem in that they are affecting the cap range. I, your combat air patrol is having to go further and further out. And you have to work out what you're going to do to things, how you're going to picket them. What are you going to use as your picket? Now, that's a question for everyone. What are you going to use as your picket? Are you going to put out a destroyer? Are you going to put out a small ship further and further away with its air, with its air defense radar? Or are you going to do something else? And so, really, the Korean War is where people start to look at the model of the idea of having a radar and having air defense radar, and what could we all use? And then people start looking, actually, and this is one of the things, Guess which aircraft shows up to start testing this off? Some of the first aircraft which are used to test what will become airborne early warning are fairy swordfish. Because they already have radars fitted for anti-submarine operations. So they play around with the radars and see if they can actually get it to work. It's a, it, 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 hey, you know, the, the swordfish, the gift that just keeps giving to British naval aviation. It gives it Taranto, it gives it the Battle Atlantic, and it gives it the starting of airborne early warning. It's just, you sit there and go, what, the, how does this aircraft get involved in so much? Hello, Daniel Phillips. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello. I can't remember which one, but one of the Seafire successes, it was just didn't work. I'm going to have to pull out a really useful book written by a uh, first test pilot. Uh, several of them just didn't work. We'll be getting into one of those later. Citizen 90. Do having an aircraft have some really fine lines? Oh, they did. Um, as Dan Freeman can testify, taking me and Drac... Around RNA, around the Fleet Air Arm Museum is an interesting experience because we are we we kind of react like the Top Gear crew going around some of these aircraft designs, going, "Ooh, it's quite fun." That's God. The Russian jet powered biplane? No, we do not talk of that. Warren Swine. We went on a school trip to Adrian Stadler's. I see I sat in a sea vixen coal hole when I was eight. Cool. Constant, the Heaven Mosquito was a technological marvel for its time. Fastest prop plane until 1944. Yep. It could have been made faster, too. They'd stuck even bigger engines in it. In car, fairy gannet is the new Blackburn Blackburn. Don't be cruel to the fairy gannet. Well, it depends which one you're talking about. The airborne early warning version or the anti-submarine warfare version, because both are interesting, but in different ways. Gadron, is there any job the swordfish wasn't hasn't been turned to in one point? Uh they did air descent air, air defense interceptor work and shot down enemy fighter aircraft. They shot down enemy bombers, they destroyed submarines, they attacked ships in harbour, attacked ships at sea. They were used to land SOE people at some point, I think. Uh, they did the float plane droll. We've already talked in the past about, well, Drac, as I was talking about him, um, their ability to do the sort of almost helicopter roll um, and airborne early warning. And, of course, they they were carrying on board delivery aircraft because, of course, Charles Lamb picks up a whole load of potatoes as well as intelligence when he's flying from Malta back to the HMS Illustrious before Toronto. I, I don't honestly think they did do pretty much every role. I think actually the Swordfish might be the progenitor of the modern carrier group.
Dan Freeman, new fleet air on board on Queen Elizabeth class. What is that swordfish doing on board 21st century aircraft carrier? Old hand. Well, it's handy to have. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> That's called the Fleet Aero Museum is fire ovenly good. Alex Clark, 2020. Uh, it is good. It, I, I've got pictures, though, in here from there, from the Australian Fleet Aero Museum, which I've never actually managed to be to, which I would really love to visit, and um, the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, which is my favourite museum in the Britain, I have to say. The IWM Duxford is... It's lovely. It's what I love to take. It, when it, 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 let, let's put it this way. I love taking students to Portsmouth. I love taking them to Chatham and all these things. They're great places to go around. They're nightmares because I get students in the rigging, but I, I get around them and they have a lot of fun. But Duxford is possibly my favourite because the aircraft there, so many of them can fly. They're not museum pieces. They are museum quality, but they're actually flying the flying models, the flying museum in a way. And that just the fact that those aircraft are still living in sort of in its term, in that they can be taken up and they can fly, just speaks to me. And this is one we put together from long forgotten de depots in Aden, Singapore. Don't joke about those long de forgotten depots. We just found one in Africa. Um, I've heard on the history net that they found a fleet air arms store in Africa. I'm not sure if it's true or not. It could be just a random rumor. So you went, faster jets made massive AA guns obsolete, developed AA missiles to speed up protection, along with faster guns tracked by computer radar. I think you've been reading my conclusion before we get there. Nick Wallace, just looked up a plane I recall thinking I think it was deliciously mad. The SRA-1 jet seaplane. Oh, that's a good one. I like the SRA. I, I, I like the jet seaplane fighter. It's a good one. The row is a good aircraft. I think it's a row. Yeah. Hendon is a good museum. Uh, Warren Swain, I take students there. I also take students to um... oh Brooklands. They're all good places to go. Twenty three for free. I won't lie. The Afari Gannet Air Force strikes me in a similar place of the glorious black man. Black man does. Just wait until you see the uh, anti submarine warfare Afari Gannet. But no, it's fun. So, another favourite. The Shuttleworth Collection. Old Warren. Primary pre-World War II aircraft. All that is good. Hello, Yogi Khan. Now, because we were just talking about it, I'm just going to quickly show a picture. That is the Saunders Row, the seaplane. Jet powered sea fighter. And it is so cool. And it's a really, really clever idea. The idea is that if you're fighting wars in places like Indonesia and out in the Far East where you don't have any airfield or many airfields and you need to have air defense, you can deploy these rather like the Japanese tried with the Zero modified for the, to be a float plane and all these sort of things. You can deploy these around the world at very, very limited infrastructure places or with a seaplane tender ship as a sport so you can move around. And they would be an air defense you could put there. 
And it's a really clever idea. Of course, it's totally you don't do it, and eventually you have the you have the Harrier come along and all these things. But it's a really, really cool aircraft, and you have never seen it. Uh, looking at it from frontwards is really, really it is this just big hole which sucks air in. You can't imagine how precise the mathematics have to be to stop that sucking water in to the engines as it's trying to take off. But it works. It flies. Um. Oh my god, is it cool? And I show you, lose air support from a swordfish. I think there was close air support from a swordfish. They were fair, they did a fair number of really interesting operations in North Africa. I think they did do close air support as well. Uh, sure, Mac. I read a saw, uh, re roll the swordfish didn't fill. I don't think a swordfish ever did a nuclear strike roll. No, I don't think. Oh, hang on. No, I don't think they were supposed to ever do that. Come on, sir. The PI needs to plan a trip to UK to check out all these neat places once COVID 19 goes away. Definitely. There are some very cool places to go for. Land Hire 3, that thing looks like a hero plane from a 50s comic. It does, and it's very, very cool. Well, long, long time ago, I may, I've made World War 1 and Burgard and Gulf, uh, Gulf War Desert Pink colours profile. Maybe it's a time to draw a swordfish in it, grey F-35 colours. Hmm, tempting. Dan these Saunders Road jet planes, would they work or on, on or rather off canals of the sort that Germany and Netherlands had a lot of? Yes. If we're giving a shout outs to museums, not aircraft related, but HMS Alliance in Gosport is really probably my favourite. Took my nieces there, uh, there and they absolutely loved it. I keep meaning to go to it and it does look really, really cool, but I haven't managed to get a reason to justify taking a load of students there. And usually I take a load of students and justify it as that because that gets me in for cheap. What can I say? I have Scottish and Cornish blood. And plus I get paid to go then. And honest, the problem with fight planes is they always suck as fighters. Actually, the Sanders Row was very, very manoeuvrable. It just wouldn't have been an extra generation of fighters and Navy wasn't sure they wanted to pay for it. And the RAF didn't want to pay for it. That's good. If I recall correctly, the road did suck water, though. Uh, but even uh, the jet engines could ingest a lot of water before flaming out. Mm, a little bit, not, it, and it did okay. It was in had to be in certain conditions for it to work, uh, for that to happen. Jack, Greg, take a look at the general and Discord improvements. I'll post something for you. Ooh. Oh, there's Eurofighters in World War II. Brown and green camo is coming. All right. Back in a second. I have some knocking. Sorry, 
Oreo cookie have been left for me. Um, right. When I was mean to go in Scotland, it's HMS Unicorn. Yeah, that's a cool one to go to. Yorkshire Museum is good with its Halifax bomber. Yeah, that is one. There's also um, various. Uh, there's one in uh, Red Hill, which is very good. Um, and on us, what about the current Chinese flying boats? I've done a whole video on flying boats, and I did cover the Chinese ones. They're not for. They're not intended for anti submarine They're intended for anti submarine warfare, not AWACS, and also for logistics of their island hopping campaign. I reckon. Anyway, the Suez Crisis comes in. So, remember, there are only six years, in fact, less than that, between the Korean War and the Suez Crisis. It's really not a long time. And a lot happens. A lot, lot really does happen. For starters, the Royal Navy carrier fleet has evolved. We now have the Centaurs in service. HMS Centaur, HMS Albion, HMS Bulwark, and HMS Hermes. We also still have some of the Colossus in service. And we also, we also have two of the Audacious class, HMS Eagle and HMS Ark Royal. And they look cute. Anonymous. Okay, we'll search for that video. Thank you, Dr. Luck. You're prolific. Lots to search for. I, I do try. Hello, Earthborn Gnome. Right, the carriers. As you can see, that is what the angled flight deck looks like when you build the ship up with it. In the in the sort of the nineteen fifties. So, Sir Edra Centaur entered service in nineteen fifty three, Albion in nineteen fifty four, Bulwark in nineteen fifty four, Hermes in nineteen fifty nine, Audacious enters uh, you'll enter service in nineteen fifty one, Ark Royal is commissioned in nineteen fifty five. So let's be honest, the Royal Navy manages in a decade to commission six aircraft carriers. Don't take this the wrong way, but that's hardly a Navy in decline in my mind. Yes, that's not a massive Navy. The Americans have more carriers upon, but in a decade, they have commissioned six aircraft carriers. They have got the air groups for six aircraft carriers. They have them all in service. Plus, they haven't, by any stretch of the imagination, decommissioned all of these. In fact, we go back to them. You can find out quite quickly which ones are still in service. Ocean. Theseus. Pi Perseus only gets scrapped in 1958. Theseus, uh, Triumph is still, still in service. Pioneer is still in service until 1954. Glory. Ocean. All still in service. So the Royal Navy has okay, several carriers in service. Plus, there's HMS Victoria still wandering around. This is not a small navy in terms of it's smaller than the US Navy, but it's not a small navy. It's not even what you call a medium navy. It's a large navy. There are the superpower. There's the superpower navy, which is the U.S. navy. Then there is probably still the Royal Navy, and then there's the Soviet navy. Yeah, the Soviet navy is pushing ahead in terms of submarines and all these things, probably shamelessly. But the Royal Navy is still well ahead in terms of aircraft carriers than anyone else other than the U.S. Uh, yes, that is the Hermes, otherwise known as HMS Elephant, which was still in service in the um, still in service in the, during the Falklands War and was only actually scrapped this year by the 
Indians in the Indian Navy. Danny Phillips, Kala has a V bomber that you can go in the cockpit of. Need to go there sometime. Ooh, sounds cool. Warren Swain, I've got some good pics of Atrium Centaur from my dad. Cool. Descott, am I right in thinking that the angled flight deck made designing and building aircraft carriers easier because it offered a counterweight to the island? Uh, to be honest, a well balanced carrier, the island really doesn't matter because the island is. Yes, it's high up, and yes, it has things, but most of the heavy weight stuff is down be down below. It's more the fl it's more the hangar which is the problem because that's a lot of heavy weight stuff quite high up in the ship. Um, the island itself isn't as much of a problem, but honestly, the angle does assist in that. You if you need that to any assistance, it does help with that a bit, but not too much. Steam White. Rumored next Indian carrier is being built with British advice. Why would that shock anyone? Let's be honest, if you're looking at carrier programs and successful mature carrier programs, the Americans have got the super carriers, but if you don't want to build something that size, you're then going down. Who else is building a carrier of the size the Indian Navy want? You've got China, which they're not going to go for because, frankly, their current issues with China. You've got France talking about it, but haven't actually built anything yet. And theirs is going to be based off some, some of the British design work and the joint Anglo-French project that went into the carriers. So, yeah, the odds are that it doesn't, it isn't a stretch of the imagination to imagine the Indians getting in contact with the British. And frankly, would fit, it fits with what I've been hearing. So, yeah. That's not exactly an unusual or unsensible thing. It's very sensible for the Indians because they want to build as high quality carriers as they can. They are have already got their own very mature designs. They are working on their own indigenous carrier project, and it's really racing ahead. It's very, very good. The fact they probably didn't talk with the British is probably because they've got their own ideas and knowledge. They've got the British experience. If you've got a chance to learn off someone and potentially have a better carrier and potentially saving yourself from falling into some pitfalls, which they might have done, it makes sense. Plus... Some of the British systems which were developed in our carrier were are very, very good. Some of the systems which the Indians have been developed in their indigenous carrier is very, very good. Frankly, I wouldn't mind nicking some of their air defense ideas, but you know, I doubt they'd be able to fit them into the British Queen Elizabeth. Nick Waters. Curious if so, I gather with uh, Vikran is mostly Russian and Italian design systems with American engines. Uh Dirt Squad, should the British government reinstate the two-power standard? <sighs> I'd love to, but which two powers are you going to pick? Are you going to pick America and China? I don't think we can afford to match that one. So who else are we picking after that? Sean Mac probably also talking to us about the carrier upsides. I have no doubt. And I have no doubt the British and the Americans are very happy to talk to the Indians because we want the, the British and Americans both understand that if you get India on side into a sort of quasi alliance, into at least a quasi alliance status, if not a full alliance status, that's a real help with dealing with China. So, in terms of the, from their perspective, so it makes sense. Then, Laura, next two largest European navies? Uh, <laughs> that would be the Italians and the French, probably. Maybe the Spanish. USS. The RCN was basically out of the traditional carrier game, but around uh, about the mid 1960s. They continued on as ASW carrier role, 
but with the Trudeau government, it was an easy target for scrapping. Yeah. Yogi Khan, in your opinion, is the help of the Russian carrier program developments? Uh, honestly, I... The interesting thing is the cat is the amphibious ships, the LHDs they are procuring. You see, I think for the Russians, the big loss was to, uh, was stopping with the forger development. If they carried on with the Yak thirty eight program ideas and developed that, then I think having a combined fleet of strike carriers and LHDs, all with ski ramps and able to operate Vistal aircraft would have been a very sensible route for the Russians to go overall. Instead, they've gone for the higher status, higher prestige of having, uh, ca uh, uh, well, having Stobar carriers and going for, potentially going for Katabar carriers eventually, a long time. But they're only maintaining one, and they've got LHDs which have no fixed-wing aviation capability. It's, yeah. Uh, that's good. <sighs> Anonymous. Carrier arms race is already happening, obviously. Uh, yeah. There is isn't it. Let's be honest. Y you can point out and go, the British order is announcing a Type 32 is the British basically going, yeah, we finally noticed that there is an arms race going on in the world and we probably need to have some more ships to try and, pe uh, to try and stop it becoming problematic. Because if one side develops too much of an advantage in numbers over the other side, then that gives them the confidence to go to war. Whereas if their sides are roughly even in terms of power and capability, if maybe if not numbers, then and presence, most importantly, then that can preserve peace. It's when one side perceives there's a sort of favorable or an unfavorable imbalance that you have um, potential of war. See, Malaski, watching this for a while now, I see the UK with a hefty amount of carriers and aircraft compared to today. Why so few today? What's the difference between today and then? Money available? Threat level? Uh, basically, government decisions in the 1960s. So this is the point when I make about CVA-1 was not going to be two carriers, it was going to be four carriers. And if you kept the fleet based around four carrier battle groups, probably through the 70s and 80s, through the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, you would have probably then started the Queen Elizabeth class program. They would probably have started entering service in the 2010s, 20, and, and they'd probably be replacing on a like-for-like -like basis. So uh, the thing is, because we made a decision to not have carriers because we were concentrating on Europe and on the Cold War and uh, putting the British Army the Rhine, because we decided that was the better strategic position, our governments did, for the Cold War, we then had all the treat from Issa Suez, then we realized that wasn't going to quite work, we then created the Invincible class, and basically it's a whole load of um, issues. And it's like the literal strike ship, which is evolving very quickly. It, it's kind of interesting, the literal strike ship isn't a new, uh, a new idea in that the um, Australians started off with it, and it turned into the, uh, started off with something very similar, it turned into the Canberra class. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happened again with this one. But in the British case, but we'll see what happens, especially if the threat levels are rising enough that they've justified ordering another five, uh, talking about another five frigates. Strub, Doctor, without knowing it, you've kept, uh, you kept me from breaking out the torch and burning down my <laughs> that steering pump when I was on my first day of leave. Removing the pump, that, uh, that should take an HR, an hour. Mm. 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 <laughs> 
Oh. So, here you go. Three of the five carriers in service in the Suez. And look at them. Yeah, you know, this is the thing. The Royal Navy in 1956 deploys five aircraft carriers to the Suez Crisis. Five. Think about that. You know, uh, <clears throat> that's not a small force. That's not a. Uh, that's a, a very, very well, a very strong force in many respects. You have HMS Ocean and HMS Theseus, two are uh, the two Colossus class aircraft carriers deployed, and they are conducting, basically working as the LPH, as I said. You have Albion, Bulwark, Eagle. You have five aircraft carriers. It's a very capable force. It's more strike power than in the uh, than the entire Egyptian Air Force can really mount. And there's land-based air support as well. This is what you have to think about when we're talking about the 1950s. So often the traditional narrative that comes out is that after World War II, Britain is a spent military force with hardly any capabilities. da di da di da you know, we're all bankrupt, we're all terrible. All these things. And to an extent, yes, that is quite true. You can find a whole base of evidence to support it. But then you sit and go, how many other countries in the world could have put five aircraft carriers together that quickly as an attack group armed with such modern aircraft. And they would be completely different aircraft carriers. I mean, three of those aircraft carriers wouldn't have even been in service at the beginning in the previous war, which was the Korean War, and they'll have all completely new air groups. How many other nations in 1956 could have done that? And this also shows the development of the jet aircraft and how quickly the jet changes things. Because if you consider, uh, we're talking about the air group in the Korean War. These are the air groups of the Korean War. The Fairy Firefly, the Fairy sea, Hawker Sea Fury, the AD-4 Sky Raider. This is the air group which fights the Suez Crisis. The Hawker Seahawk, the Western Wyvern, the de Havilland Sea Venom, the Sky Raider, a the Airborne Early Warning. It's a completely different air group. Okay. Consent, we'd really see who makes the best Eastern Warsaw. Uh, pack stuff if Russia and China go to war. It would be quite interesting. I would prefer not to, though, because they're both nuclear powers and it's all sorts of weird stuff. Martin Locke, the monkey in the room is recruitment and retention of personnel, something Adrian Force is struggling with. Uh, no, actually. Um, as of today, the Royal Navy actually has free sites open for training new recruits. They've got it up to, it, it's gone up to something like one and a half. Uh, let's see, there's 500 at 500 Raleigh, 500 Collingwood, I think, and another couple of hundred at Dartmouth, I think, possibly. I'm not sure. But you, know, you have a huge number of people going through training at the moment in the Royal Navy. And reserves are really thriving. So, uh, yes, there's been a increase thank, uh, during uh, due to lockdown. People have been jumping in for it. But also, the Royal Navy is starting to put together a fairly decent package. They've worked on the housing issues. They've worked, on, they've worked, they've asked good at selling the future Navy. Plus, there's the fact that the Type 26, the Type 31, are all on the Type 32, presumably, will be, are all far lower crew requirements than their predecessors. And that has a big impact in terms of your requirements for recruiting. So they're recruiting more, but they, you know. Mm -hmm. Italy. Italy has their F 35B, has had their first F 35Ws delivered. The Republic of Korean Navy and joint Marit Japanese Maritime Self Defense Force on a contract. And yes, 
I also, I wouldn't be surprised if the Republic of Korean Navy and the Japanese Maritime Self Defense Force also end up procuring a version of Crow's Nest off the British to turn their, and give their carriers an AEW capability. Nutty Hyper One. Hello, United Kingdom Royal Air Force Royal Navy both operate the F 35B, known simply as the Lightning in the British service. Correct. It definitely is. It's fun times. Ian Carl, remember six RN carriers commando ships off Aden for assembled shortly after the Six Day War in 1967. Yes, it, they have quite a large number of. Vessels available. Adam Flinton, hello. How much will automation cut per ship cru cruise? Uh, a lot. There is a lot of automation going in, but there's also a lot of redundancy being put in, i.e. multiple systems rather than multiple people. And there's also the fact that you can do more. Uh, the computer systems allow you to do more with less. Because if you can find a problem more quickly without with doing less digging around and manual checking in the systems, it takes a lot less time to fix it. Because often, quite a lot of the time of a crew in maintenance and fixing problems on a ship are finding exactly where the problem is. Garmin, Royal Navy had to allow non-officers into Dartmouth to give up earlier this year. Yes, it did. Yeah, um, the, the interesting thing is the whole way through all the crises and various other things, the um, service which keeps getting cut the most is the Royal Marines in terms of numbers of all the land forces, and they're the ones who have the least trouble recruiting. They always exceed their targets. For some reason, the Royal Marines, it's a state of mind, is really, really attractive. But let's talk through these aircraft a bit more, because I want to talk about what their various roles are. So... They do actually have separate roles. And it's worthwhile thinking about those separate roles. So, the Seahawk is a fighter attack aircraft. The Sea Venom is a night or weather fighter. So, basically, the Seahawk is mm, usually daylight hours only. Why? Because, again, it comes down to landing in the dark and taking off in the dark. It's quite complicated, especially with jets and high speed. So, uh, Sea Venom is actually better for that. You have the Gan uh, you have Sky Raider, airborne early warning aircraft, which, again, is all weather capable. And you have the Western Wy Wyvern. Why? Because, again... That is your fighter attack aircraft, which can work at night. Because they're still getting a Seahawk's cable. What's interesting also to look at it is that the Seahawk and the Sea Venom have a similar main armament in that the Seahawk's uh, weaponry is 420mm Hispano cannon, which can be seen quite easily. In this picture, and so is the Sea Venom's main armament. Sea Venom will carry two thousand pound bombs and eight sixty pound uh, rockets. The Sea Hawk will carry four five hundred pound bombs or twenty rockets or two, um, well, two ninety Imperial gallon. That's 108 US gallon uh, drop tanks. It's a cool aircraft. They're cool aircraft, and they're very capable aircraft. Sky Raider AWW has been developed because of the Korean War experience. Literally, the Royal Navy goes into the Korean War and starts going, 
We have a problem. We have a big problem. We have a very, very big problem. And at a certain point, they go, right then, we need to fix this problem. Also, another aircraft, which is around this point, but doesn't really get much presence in the Suez Crisis because, for some reason, the Royal Navy decides he doesn't really need it to take on the Egyptians at this point, is this glorious beast, a.k.a. the Fairy Gannet anti-submarine warfare aircraft. Yes. I know, I know, it's beautiful. We all can admit this. This is a glorious looking aircraft. Look at it. It's so bumpy and wumpy. And <laughs> it's got contra-rotating propellers. It's got it's got everything you could wish for. Like the like the Western Wyvern has contra-rotating propellers. It's just they're just glorious. Hello, Trent Delanco. I was talking about you earlier. The clock. I have the impression the American reaction to Suez Crisis was the reason the 1960s UK dumped CV groups. The US removed their place their peacetime power projection and presence utility. Uh not really. It's more of a calculation over, as I said, Eastern Europe and over the Cold War in Europe. But um, we'll talk about that another time. And as I said, the Suez Crisis, the American public reaction was very different to their private reaction. Well, I'm sorry, Seahawk is just so pretty. It is pretty. But, you know, have you seen the fairy gannet? <laughs> ah. Peter Dawson, your Wyvern is a Mark I because it has the exhaust of a RR Eagle engine, not the later S4. I agree, it is one of the ones. It looks close enough to the others, and it's the nicest picture I could find of them. I have it a Western one, Wyvern. Um, there are various pictures which don't look as nice. So, Peter Davison, you are correct, but, you know, I was going for a nice picture. Wayne, uh, Wayne Swarren, I was disappointed to find the gate garden outside it from a Seahawk, Carl Rose is now a fiberglass replica. Unfortunately, it has been for the last few years, for the last few years. And I have, I think I'm one of the last people to have a photograph with the with the non fiberglass replica. Mm. I can't say five bladed plot frame. I think you're talking about an eight bladed one. They're both contra rotating four bladed props. We'll get to the uh, we'll get to the gan uh, the um, fairy gannet ASW uh, uh, AW aircraft. Don't worry, that is coming. That is on my list of aircraft to uh, show at some point. So, what are their tactics? Well, their tactics reflect their threat. And as remember, I again. In a article which I've got linked to down below in the description, which is about uh, which is told the Sveldov class and the Royal Navy's reaction to them, I talk about this in great deal. The RN's long-term reaction to the Sveldov class is developing the Bucca uh, Blackburn Buccaneer, but their tactics are also reflective of that. In 1956, they're using saturation air air attacks to take out the enemy air defences, air bases, and infrastructure and then close air support to support the troops moving in. It is very simple tactics. It's tactics like you had in the Korean War. It's tactics. It's not really naval tactics as you'd think of it. However, they do have Sky Raiders doing their airborne early warning, and those are very useful in pushing forward the radar blanket so that the cap can engage the Egyptian aircraft. Now, the Egyptian aircraft never really have a chance to get close to the carriers. They have no hope of getting close to the carriers because there is the carrier, let's say, is here. The Sky Raider will be orbiting doing a sort of figure of eight here. And the cap will be up threat here. 
and the Sky Raider will pick you up here. The cat will intercept you around about here, and you will never get anywhere near here. And that's the whole purpose of having airborne early warning. So that's the big tactical development. But mainly these things are, there's a lot of technology bubbling on the surface. A lot of stuff is coming through. And a lot of the things are going through and developed are being about watching what the Soviet Union is doing, watching what they're developing. And reacting to them. The Russians don't have aircraft carriers at this point. They have cruisers. But those cruisers are looked at as surface raiders. That's certainly what the, uh, the Soviet Union seems to be talking about them as. And what British intelligence, most importantly, is picking up them talking about them as. So it's what the Royal Navy is looking at its aircraft carriers to deal with. Its aircraft carriers will have, in any war against the Soviet Union, will have the job of supporting the Northern Barrier, will have the job of supporting operations in Norway, maybe operations in the Mediterranean, but also certainly will have the role of global operations in the South Atlantic and potentially the Indian Ocean to track down any Soviet surface raiders and stop them interdicting supplies. Because again, any global war is a war of economic warfare. And the more you can keep the trade and existing supply routes going, the more you can keep your economy going, the more you can afford to fight the war. Adam Finton, the Gannett answers the question of who ate all the pies. That's cruel. Hold off on it till we get to the airborne early one. Nutty Hyper One. Douglas A1 Sky Raider served from late 40s to early 80s. Yes, it does, but not with the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy replaces it with the Gannett. Don't get me started. And honest, Soviets don't appear to have ever considered a service raider campaign. Uh, actually, they do. There are huge files in the National Archives of that the Royal Navy has, do has done their intelligence. And you can go and read their entire intelligence reports and what they're translating on them. The Soviet Union are the leading researchers into the German archives on surface raiders and what they get up to. And it's the leading workers in terms of what they're getting up to in terms of their, when they're talking about their design and how they're justifying them. So, yeah, that's pretty much what the British are basing it off their own intelligence services estimates on, uh, and their own intelligence services information they have got from the Soviet Union. Uh, and Anonymous, look, you're thinking about it as in terms of the German surface raiders failing as they're sinking, they're not sinking many ships, and I do agree with that. But the Soviet Union were looking at it not as in terms of sinking ships, but as turn as tying up allied ships, okay? So here's the thing. The Soviet Union's plan of operations is to win in the North uh, is to win in the North Atlantic. Any resources from the Allies you can have having to fight elsewhere in the world means ships they don't have in the North Atlantic. So let's put it this way. If I have a single cruiser in the South Atlantic, a carrier battle group probably has to go down and track it down. If I have a single carrier cruiser in the Indian Ocean, a carrier battle group has to go track that down. So you're thinking of surface raiders in terms of what they do in terms of their actual impact. Actually, the Soviet Union were thinking in terms of their threat and the enemy resources they type. Remember, they're thinking about a short war and they want it to be a very quick war where they overpower. They don't want supplies coming through from America. Their best chances of interdicting supplies going across the North Atlantic is if they can significantly weaken the Allied forces that will face them in the North Atlantic. They can't, they can't guarantee to do that directly in fighting. But if they can pair off one or two carrier battle groups to go to the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean to hunt down surface raiders, that is a huge chunk of force taken from the, uh, from America, from the North Atlantic campaign. You multiply that by having a couple down there, having four or five ships wandering around the world, and you probably have six or seven air carrier battle groups have to be dedicated to tracking them down. That keeps them busy for a few weeks. Yes, 
it might they might not score many kills in terms of taking out merchant ships, but that doesn't matter. What matters is you've significantly weakened the amount of force the allies can bring to bear. So you you have to think about it. What the Russians were specifically interested in, very, very interested in, was the amount of forces that those surface raiders tied down from the British. And this is the point we made when we talked about the Graf Spey, when I was talking about Force K and various other things. The sheer amount of naval forces the British had to dedicate to the operation of tracking them down. This is the point. This is what the Soviets were interested in. They're not interested in doing a surface raider campaign in terms of it killing any ships. They're interested in terms of it tracking, of it distracting the uh, distracting the British. And this is the 1950s and the 60s. Again, Anonymous, you're talking about they do go all in on subs, but we're talking about the 1950s here. Okay? They go all in subs in the 60s and 70s. And even then, they start bringing up aircraft carriers and large ships at certain points. And that's largely to protect the bastions, but we'll leave that to one side. This is the 1950s, and this is what Britain's reacting to. The Britain in 1950s doesn't know what the Soviet Union is going to suddenly decide to focus on in the 1960s and 70s. They're reacting to what they're focusing on in the 1950s and what they're talking about in the 1950s and what their intelligence is gathering from the 1950s. And the Soviet Union in the 1950s is thinking about a surface raider campaign to distract the Allies. And the British know this, but also you know, they can't afford to ignore them. Because if they do take out large numbers of merchant ships, then they aren't, do have a problem. So they're in a catch-22. They don't want to divert forces to deal with them. But again, your aircraft carrier can't be in two places at once. It can't be providing aircraft to support the, ca the barrier campaign in the North Atlantic while hunting in the South Atlantic for a surface raider. And remember, it's not just the carrier which goes. It has to take escorts with it. It has to take its supply ships with it. It's a thing where they have to deal with it. They know that the Soviet Union isn't planning on doing a full-blown anti-attack down there unless they get the opportunity. But that means you have to go deal with it. And the Soviet Union doesn't mind losing a couple of cruisers. They don't mind it. They're banking on it. They're really not worried about it for the pursuit of fighting the North Atlantic campaign because, as you say, they're thinking about it from the, uh, using submarines primarily in that role. Jeremy, I've taken a look, uh, uh, taken a look some time. Iron Sky Rose were sold to Sweden and used there as firefighting planes, if I remember correctly, to the 80s. Yeah. Race car meerkat. Hello. Getting a Canberra vibe from Seahawk, but that can't be right. Ah. Grace asking. Soviet Navy's problem is lack of ports in places where they wouldn't ha have to sneak out or fight their way out, hence subs. The Soviet Carabao group can't easily go out into the open ocean. Again, they're not worried. It's a surface radar, and they don't expect them. What happens is the moment these this starts, they as a service, their job is to sail around the world to potential allies in Africa, South America, and all these things. Do port visits, diplomacy. So they're doing a naval diplomacy, global presence mission. I.e., we're the Soviet Union. We can reach here. Da 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 da. You, the uh, well, NATO has to track us and. As I said, tying up NATO resources in the event of a war, so that in the first few crucial first couple of weeks of the first two, three weeks of any campaign, NATO forces can't concentrate in the North Atlantic. They can't concentrate because they have to go deal with these other forces. Anna Flinton, Soviets called the SN cruisers. So also set commerce for does? To an extent, yes. Karma Gasworth, even the cruise marine counted more on the resources tied down by the Panzer Chief. Yep. <coughs> mm -hmm. Ben Laura, if you can control North Atlantic for a couple of weeks, the Russians have a great chance of licking NATO out of, uh, of kicking NATO out of Western Europe. If they can dispute control of the North Atlantic for a couple of weeks, then they have a great chance. If they can actually control the North Atlantic for a couple of weeks, they can do it. Uh, that's how. Oh, that's what it is.
Come guys one. If they are good for a missile spamming a carrot house horse, SG and also good against convoys. As per Red Storm Rising. Yep. There are definitely all these things. Alright then. So what is the big development in this period? Well, it's airborne early warning. And I wasn't sure where to put this slide, but I decided to put it here. Because you've got the radar horizon of your own ship. And the line of sight to the enemy aircraft and the ship below the horizon will not be detected. So you have issues with having your radar being on your own sh on ships. And this is why you start to develop your airborne early warning aircraft. And yes, that is my drawing. Way off topic. How realistic is the Red Storm Rising? Uh, disturbingly so in many areas. In fact, I use it as the basis of some of the um, tabletop uh, war gaming and exercises my, I had students do at certain points. And as you can see, there is a fairy gannet flying over HMS Eagle in the 1970s. And you can see the lovely air group. Now, air defense at sea is all done with layers. So we have our aircraft layer, our air area air defense layer, our point air defense layer, and our close-in weapon system out there. So basically, the idea is that, you know, that aircraft, miss, uh, you will try and take out your enemy as far as they can, whereas they can. The whole point of the F-14 and to extent the F-4 when it was being used by the British, was the idea was that with airborne early warning, it would manage to take out the bombers before they launched their missiles in any war in the North Atlantic. You want to do that because if you can engage 30 bombers, that's far easier than engaging 120 missiles. It is. 30 bombers are easier to take out than 120, 120 missiles if they all launch 4 missiles or 60 missiles. It doesn't matter. There are always fewer carrying aircraft than there are missiles. Well, barring some types of missile, but we'll lead up to one side. And then your area air defense is supposed to try and take out as many missiles as are launched as possible. And then if any air missiles leak through, they're supposed to be taken out by the point air defense. But that's also the point at which you start launching chaff and countermeasures. Electronic warfare goes mad. You start jamming and everything you can. If missiles are still locked in and coming in close, that's when they get into the close-in weapon system range. And ideally, that's where you will knock them out and knock them out hard. Because close in weapon system range is very close to terminal range. Terminal range is the point at which the inertia and energy of the air of the missile or the weapon system means that no matter it doesn't matter if you damage it, it will still hit the ship. And that has the potential of causing damage. Any hit on the ship has the potential of causing damage. So this is the point. The whole thing is to keep it as far away as possible. Now Here's the thing. Radar Horizon, this thing, uh, doesn't matter so much with piston aircraft, with propeller aircraft, because the maximum they can do is 400 miles or so an hour. 460 miles an hour is what the Sea Fury does, and that's one of the fastest of ones I've ever, ever made. And if it's going at maximum speed, which it can't do for ever, and that limits its range. So the thing is, that pops up if your range is sixty odd, let's say sixty miles of range. That still gives you precious minutes before it will get within range. It might do. Let's say it's eighty miles for ease of mass. Well, if it's doing four hundred miles an hour, eighty miles will take twelve minutes. So it's twelve minutes away. If its speed is 800 miles an hour, then it's six minutes away. Okay. 
This is the problem. So this is why you suddenly need to start thinking about your range. And this is why airborne early warning comes in. Because if you take your radar up a higher, then that extends the radar horizon. Because that line just keeps changing. Let's say this is the fulcrum. And there's your radar. The higher your radar goes, the further that fulcrum moves around the Earth. That point that's pivoting on moves around the Earth. And that is what you're looking for. And then if you start to go, right, then I can move my aircraft because it's an airborne early warning aircraft forward, then it does even better. And that gives you far better range. So this is why airborne early warning is so important and why I really, really hate what happens in the Falklands because Britain knows this. Britain has been developing airborne early warning. We've gone through two freaking generations of airborne early warning aircraft. We've had the Sky Raiders and then we've had the Gannets. We've kept it the whole way through and then they make the decision over CVA-01. We get the Harriers. But no one thinks airborne early warning. We still need airborne early warning. No, no, no. You can't have it because you'll always be under the air defense, airborne early warning of either an allied carrier or land-based AEW. So you don't need it. You can't have it. You can't have it. It's wasteful. They lose ships. The whole, Pretty much every ship lost in the Falklands War without a bar none. Two aircraft, every ship lost, can be put down to the lack of airborne early warning because you'd have got warned earlier, the cap could have got on station earlier. And as we know from lessons in World War II, from lessons in Korea, not in Korea and other things, but lots of lessons in World War II, if you can disrupt a strike coming in, it doesn't matter what your relative capabilities of your aircraft are versus the enemy. If they disrupt the strike coming in, break it up, the attack, then that attack loses a huge amount of its likelihood of causing any damage. And frankly, the Sea Harrier was good enough. The range from the Argentine and mainland to the Falkland Islands operating area was great enough that they would have had still had a massive advantage the advantages they enjoyed, but they'd have had early warning, so you could have vectored the cap in before they hit, rather than the cap often chasing tail and chasing the Argentines out and taking them out on the way out. Which does, I mean, have a, an effect on their operations and does take out their, their skilled pilots and does have an effect on their ability to keep generating air attacks as they're losing airframes and all these things and morale, but seriously, the big lesson and the big development, I would argue, of jet that comes in with jets and comes in is the need for airborne early warning and the development of airborne early warning. And the fact that it's on mounted on piston aircraft, I find really, really cool because the reason it's put on piston aircraft is uh, propeller and, and piston aircraft is because they need to be up for a long time. They need endurance more than speed and they need to carry a heavy load. It's just... Mm. Adam Fenton, commerce is fewer but bigger merchantmen. Very different convoys. Oh, yes. Jennifer, two beautiful creations. Fairy Gannet and Lady Eagle. Eye candy for naval historians. Yes. Nick's, Nick Waters. They had a Russian sub hearted next to the wreck of the Achilles Lauro. I think that I initially laughed, then thought, ah, Fancy has spoken to some sub skipper who did it, hasn't he? Mm, Come Red Storm was discussed by Duff Clark in one of the early brew ships. Africa, most the most unrealistic part of the convoy battles was that escorts were more eager for hard kill uh, uh, instead of just chasing subs away. Yeah. Ian Carl, why were new carriers not Ark Royal and Eagle? Honestly, because. Arc Roll had just been used in the previous class, and I'm not sure why not Eagle. Um, Eagle would have been a cool one to bring back. The planned names for the CVO ones were Queen Elizabeth, Prince of Wales. Uh, no, Queen Elizabeth, Prince of Wales, 
Arkroll and Eagle, I think. No, Arkroll and Hermes? Arkroll and Eagle, I think, actually. Maybe? No, it was Arkroll, definitely. Might have been an... Un un hmm. I forget what the fourth one was going to be called. Uh, Calvin Gas, re 20 minutes to close the motion. Even if it managed to blow up a guy at 812 meters, there is still a chance that the explosion showers your ship with fragments looking and knocking out radar. As I said, it has to kill it before it gets in terminal range. That's what terminal range is. This is why I support the 40 millimeter. This is why I want double 40 millimeters as, clo as a closing weapon system. I want a double 40 millimeter flak weapon. Because I want to shred those things before they get within terminal range. I.e. preferably at 2,000 to 3,000 meters. I don't know. Back to fires uh, used wolf pack. Possibly Voskos in the was wolf pack. Uh, probably. Uh, but again, that's after this period. Nutty F1. Was the Seeking AW was made after or before that war? After the Falklands War was when Seeking AW came in. It was suddenly made a priority and developed. And by the way, Seeking AW first off uses the same ra the radar which has been saved from the uh, fairy gannets. So, the air group of the late 50s. I wanted to talk about this because the air group of the late 50s is always quite a cool one to talk about. Did Gannet Airborne Oil need a sea catapult, steam powered catapult to launch? Yes, it did. See, Adam Fenton, Duke of Edinburgh. No, I don't. It wasn't the Duke of Edinburgh. Sorry, the the Queen of the Queen's concert that doesn't get a ship named after them in terms of that sense. Um, I think they were they were looking at potential ships being called Duke of Edinburgh, but it wasn't going to CVO one. All right, then. So, this is the picture of HMS Bulwark at this exercise in Singapore during CETO um, exercise. And that was 1958. reason I brought this up is because I thought it quite interesting that HMS Queen Elizabeth will probably be taking part in various exercises out there. Uh, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. Mm well, the various descendants of that and all sorts of things, but uh, you've got HMS Melbourne and you've got USS Philippine Sea and they were working together quite happily. The Gannet Anti-Submarine Warfare Squadron was dropped in 1958, mainly because they were trying to carry more helicopters and they forgot helicopter AS ASW might be better. So you have 801 Naval Air Squadron, uh, with eight Seahawks, fighter attack, 898 Naval Air Squadron, again, fighter air attack. So they've got 16 Seahawks, eight Sea Venoms, six Gannets, four Sky Raiders, five Whirlwinds, and a Dragonfly. So you have 40 aircraft. Now, the point I'm going to make about this is simple. She's designed, originally, they had this idea they're going to be able to operate about 60 aircraft from them. That's the original idea when they're talking about pistoned aircraft you know, at the end of World War, II, uh, World War II when they're designing. They're looking about 60 aircraft, maybe more. Possibly they could even have got to 70 because of the size difference. These aircraft are bigger. They are Really bigger. The Sky Raider and the Gannets are truly chunky monkeys. And the Venom and the Seahawks are no slouches either. Combine up helicopters. You have 40 good aircraft, but you have a full air group of 40 aircraft. Greg Salsi, re lack of AW in the Falklands. Was there a blind spot in the RN NATO ex expected to operate in open sea where ground clutter was not as much of an issue for the radar pickets? Uh. Not really. The RN wasn't expected. It did expect to operate in open sea in terms of doing the convoy route from North America to the UK and back again. But they also expected to operate in in Norway. 
The trouble is they only had, I think it was two frigates fitted with the kind of um, radar you needed for operating inshore in Norway. And both those frigates, it's the story I sort of remember, weren't available for the actual Falklands War and came down with the Bristol group, I think. It's something like that. Anyway, uh, after the end of well, after the end of the Falklands War, that's the two priorities that are going to during the war. The priority going into the war is developing and getting AW, and when the next carrier comes down after the Falklands War, um, I think it's Illustrious comes down, and she does have airborne seeking AW on board, and the next year they have things like they have their radars modified so they can work inshore with the ground clutter. Um, yes, on this occasion, HMS Melbourne did manage to avoid colli uh, colliding with anyone else, but, you know, it's always a close-run thing. Come on, HMS uh, Simru, Wales, Simru, Welsh for Wales, then HMS England, HMS Northern Ireland or something. Uh, no. Now, there was actually a question, just quickly. Uh, Ben Lara, quick off-topic speculation on naming scheme for the Type 31s and 32s. Our refuser class, I'm hoping for the Type 31s and Type 32s. Depending on what they are, I have some ideas. Um, e class? F class? I could go with. Like the, the, like the um, E class are sort of being used, so probably be the F or G's class, or maybe during the H class. Could be quite fun to bring back. I'd love to say tribals, but I, I, I doubt they'd go for them anymore. That's not really PC enough. Maybe battles. Again, not really PC enough, but they could do it. Some kids. Good evening. Minor light carriers and no large fleet carriers in the Korea. Hangar size, manpower shortages, or two went up for the front line service? Uh, actually, because they're in major refits. It's what's available in Korea. I remember what I said about the big refits going on. Well... They've all been used heavily during World War II. But HMS Victorious basically goes into refit in... Let's see. HMS Victorious goes into refit and reconstruction in 1950 and doesn't emerge till 1958 because of the new technologies coming through. It's the same with a lot of other large carriers involved. It's a case of Victorious is a lovely thing to have, but, you know, and she does come into service later on. And we do have Another picture I can show. I'll quickly go. I'll quickly. How do I put this? Uh, quickly flash up this because I want to talk about. There is the Fairy Gannet AW aircraft in color. Thought you might enjoy that one. That's with its folded wings. So it's doing. It's doing this, as you can see. That's what these aircraft are doing to fold up their wings. It's, it's always fun. Yeah, got to contra-rotate it, got to do, uh, got to, um, well, stand like an Egyptian and, uh, and play that song. And da -da 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 -da. let's get up the other picture. This is from about 1959, I think, and it's Victorious, her, uh, her, uh, Victorious, let's see, it's, remember correctly, it's Victorious, Ark Royal, and Hermes, so it's one of each of the types of carriers in service at the time. This is the Royal Navy, it's powerful, but this is it. In 1959, so it's a it's a large force. It's capable. It's a capable naval service.
And there's another picture of the Sea Venom because I said she's one of the she's the cutest aircraft discussed in this point. But this is the one from the Royal Australian uh, Fleet Air Arm Museum. Rather cool. Nick Waters, I read that the Type 22 having Seawolf, only chance of taking Exeter, and T-42 having the big radar meant they resorted to running a cable across the T-22 in the Falklands. Sound right? No. Uh, they didn't at all run a, ca a cable across between them. They did operate as a pair. They did do uh, what's called the 42-22 combo. And they did very well as a pair when they were working well together. But sometimes the ships, individual ships didn't work that well together. Hmm. Peter, that's awesome. Seeking AW had search water radar based on that of Nimrod, not the World War Two or the uh, uh, Sky uh, not World War Two or the Sky Raiders via Gannets. Uh... Okay, so the aircraft, which when it comes into proper service, you would be right, but the aircraft which is rushed into service to go down with illustrious. As I've always understood it, they had some spare ones left over from the Gannet still knocking around, and they get them reworked and fitted. Um, and then the ones which take it properly have it have an, a search water radar, a, ra a search water radar based on what was being developed for the Nimrod AEW. Sean Mac, do any photos exist of when the US, uh, US pilot found God inside the Gannet? No. Dev Squad, are the iron carriers in refit also having to get a lot of the damage and wear caused by heavy wartime service repaired and replaced? Yes. Uh, engines basically being rebuilt and refitted. Ah, let's go back to it. Now, as you can see, when they're folding up their aircraft, they're doing that. They're not at uh, their wings. They do that. They um, come in like this. They go straight normally and slightly down, but they fold up and they go like this so they can fit inside the hangar of a Royal Navy aircraft carrier. And also they do that because that actually makes it easier to get in to maintain the radar. So that was one of the reasons why they were considered a very good aircraft for the airborne early warning. Ah, <coughs> oh, lovely conclusion. Right, as you can see, I am out of iron brew, so I will probably go through this conclusion, and as it's nine o'clock, hmm, fairly quickly. I'm not sure what's happened, but... um. At some point, the some point X split seems to have reset itself back to zero. So according to that, it's saying it's only been going for 54 minutes. But um, yeah, so I'm going just from memory. And I think I've given you, I think I've done my normal three hours. So, so I hope I haven't disappointed anyone. But let's, uh, as I said, running out of liquid, I ran out of liquid. So the roughly conclusion is, is it always, uh, is always, is it technology, geostrategic reality, or threat that forces changes? Well, it's a mixture of all three. It's a changing of this kind of war. In many ways, it's World War II turns from being a global war searching and finding the enemy to being a war of engaging the enemy in positions where you know where they are. And that explains some of the changes in the air group. And some of the air group varieties. 
post World War Two, you have a rundown in your number of carriers for starters. You lose a huge number of escort carriers. You lose all sorts of other carriers get that have to go, and you have jet aircraft come in which are bigger and they take time to implement. So that's why the 1950s is still piston aircraft for a large chunk of it. And then the second half of the 1950s are all these first generation, really, jets for naval aviation. And they grow, and they're big, and they're noisy, and they're lovely, but they take time. And they do cause things to have to happen. You have to develop airborne early warning. You have to develop all sorts of techniques and operational tactical knowledge to get the best out of them, because Jets operate differently than piston aircraft. They bring different capabilities to the uh, to the uh, to the sort of mix. They're far higher speed, but they also require more ma more intricate maintenance, especially the first generation ones, which affects how you're going to operate them and how you're going to operate the carriers. So you have to develop the carriers to take them on. The carriers have to evolve. So everything has to evolve to an extent to deal with the coming in of the jets, but also there are things which stay the same. Yes, you still got to do the air defense. You've still got to have a cap. A combat air patrol is not going to be ignored just because your aircraft are faster so they can theoretically take off the deck and get over there. No one's going to try that anymore. They know that one's not going to work. And how are you going to hit aircraft? Well, honestly, you've already been heading more towards bombs. You've already been heading towards missiles in terms of rockets and development. You are looking at the idea of, hang on, can we use torpedoes from jets? Not really. A jet-powered aircraft using torpedoes to attack ships? Not really going to work. It's too close range. Anti-submarine operation? Fine. Uh, no. So, yeah. The effects of the early jet age on tactics is pushing them out further. It's speeding up those tactics. It's pushing, it's forcing those tactics to evolve. They're not really ch new tactics, but they're evolving tactics. They're changing from what's already been in process because they have to push out the ranges because it speeds everything up. Right. Mondok, when they did, were refitting or rebuilding victories, did they not find that the kamikaze hit caused more damage than was first thought, and that added a lot of time to rebuild? No, it wasn't the kamikaze damage which caused hit. It was various bomb damages and shakes throughout the war. They found that they'd had a lot of mm, little bits of damage, which hadn't been noticed really there, but while they were going through it. Nutty Hyper One, hello. How about a question? When did Canada did study to replace our supply ships since we hadn't had a, any few years? Once they was to uh, do a total package troop ship like Wascars with fully supply, uh, full, uh, uh, fully supplied duties and six for F thirty fives. What are your thoughts? I think for the Canadians and LHD might be a good idea, but it would they'd have to be prepared to pay for it and invest in it. It, I think if you're defending the high north, an, F, uh, an LHD makes a very sensible uh, options, but they're probably never going to find the, buy the F-35Bs. So then having the LHD becomes sort of, do you need it or do you just need a, a support ship which has a rather large capa capacity for taking troops and a lot of helicopters? Come on, the Seafixen is a kind of craft which is pretty at first, but your eyes begin to bleed after a while. Nah, they're just gorgeous. John Shea, question about the AD4A1 Skyraider. If the aircraft was introduced in late 43 or early mid 44, would it have replaced the SB2C TBF um, Barracuda? Or would it have been uh, too big for a lesser class? It would probably have been used. It would have been. Greg Salsing, I and Peru liters per hour is a better measure of time than software. Mm, potentially. I mean, what else? The mistrials were LHDs the French agreed to sell Russia, but the French government ended up saying no. But they'd already sold the designs and quite a lot of the ideas for the technology, so the Russians are building their own, which will be interesting variations. Um, with a lot of Russian tech added in, or a lot more Russian tech in, added in. But the main trouble holding them up is getting decent turbines, because since they invaded Ukraine, in car, Sea Vixen, a great looking aircraft, but of the 145 current instructed, 55 were lost in accidents. Yeah. Seems, like, seems now carriers have multi purpose planes and their specialized types. It's kind of interesting in that they got 
prior to World War II, there was a lot of general purpose aircraft, which did a lot of roles. Then during World War II, when the air groups and number of aircraft carriers expand, they have a lot more specialized aircraft. And now we've reached the point where aircraft carrier numbers are pretty much at the lowest they've been since the interwar years. And we're getting a lot more general purpose aircraft. It's basically, it, you go with the aircraft you have available. And the thing is, with a carrier, you can't change your... You can change your air group, but, you know, it, it, it's far more difficult. It, it's good. The aircraft it's got is the aircraft it's got, to an extent. So, yeah, they're getting more than general purpose at the moment. But, again, if carrier numbers grew, wouldn't be surprised if some specialists started to reappear. I'm surprised long-range anti-submarine warfare, anti-submarine fixed air wing hasn't turned up again. Probably will do once they have UAVs. That will do it. So that's got another reason why piston aircraft were still dominant in aviation with reliability. Yes, they were very, very reliable. Warren Swine, re victorious. She had a fire on board. It was my dad's ship at the time. Uneconomic with its proposed life. Yeah. That's what I got rid of. Carl Harmon, do you think we could have any prop aircraft on HMS Queen Elizabeth? If so, what would it look like? Probably something like a Super Tucano or a UCAV. Uh, um, it would be a Stoll aircraft, short takeoff and landing variant. Come on, that piston aircraft equals loiter. Jets, not so much. Yeah. Sapio UK, did you find a good sci-fi cruiser? Well, Sapio UK, I've had many suggestions. The thing is, my requirement for question, I may possibly didn't make this clear in the video, but I did try and mention the description, was that I was looking for a good cruiser, which actually represented as a cruiser, doing a cruiser role. Um. Starfleet lower decks, a Star Trek lower decks is probably not because they run from pretty much anything because everything's bigger than them. So they're more a sort of frigate in that era, in that sort of idea, or maybe a sloop, but everything's bigger than them. And so they have to run from everything. The Galaxy class and the other ones are that are often presented on screen are actually capital ships. I would argue the Voyager's Intrepid class are probably the closest to a cruiser, but they're not built in numbers. And this is the thing. Usually you build cruisers in far greater numbers than you build cargo ships. And this is my main problem with sci-fi fleets, as they're often represented on screen. When you look at the books, though, and the Honorverse and e um, DJ Holmes' Empire Rising, you find cruisers are the dominant ships. And there is a reason for that. If you're actually doing an actual practical space first, it does make sense. And of course, the Andromeda Ascendant is technically classed as a cruiser, as is the Galaxy class, but they are the capital ships. There aren't really battleships featured on screen. And that's really interesting and the strange of the um, Star Trek, because I don't know if you ever remember, if you, any of you have the old Get Star Trek game, which I have. Um, although I currently do not have A computer which can operate it, unfortunately, but Starfleet Command. Um, I used to love this game. It was cool. It was so many ideas which are now standard, and you know, you think of you can train your crew and all these sort of things were in this game. It's a really, really cool game. And if I can get it working on my new gaming computer when I get a new gaming computer set up, I will be a very, very happy man. I will also probably lower, have a lot of far lower production levels because I'll be so busy playing it again going. <laughs> but there is an absolutely excellent battleship design in it for Starfleet. Never turns up in any of the movies or in anything. And it's a really cool, really capable ship with missiles, photon torpedoes, phasers, shuttles, the lot. You could turn up and you can basically go and sit there and go, you brought your whole fleet, have you, Klingons? Good. I will munch you for dinner. It was brilliant, but no. So, because they don't feature those, the Galaxy class actually become capital ships. That's what they used as. They are the capital... Pre they are the big flagships, the present ships, and that's the same in Andromeda Ascendant. Um, 
as I said, the, the, the trouble is in many ways they the, the television representation of these things is really, really known. Um, several people um, talked about the Miranda class, which is a good idea, and I think I could agree with that. Excelsior class, I don't think uh, they don't think they get used as cruisers enough. They they don't they're not built as it. They're built as capital ships. They might end up doing the cruiser roles after a while, but that's because they're no longer the frontline capital ships. And when you go into Star Wars, no, it, 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 people keep trying to argue the Imperial Star Destroyer, and that's just not. That is not a cruiser. That is a capital ship. Yes, they built twenty five thousand of them. Mm, but it's not a cruiser. It is the capital ship. It is made for fighting other ships and being a big freaking fighting tool. You can tell it's not a car cruiser because a cruiser has a general purpose weapons fit. And you know, honestly, Battlestar, um, the Valkyrie bat class Battlestar is far more like a cruiser in many ways in its fit than the Imperial Star Destroyer. But there again, the battle the Valkyrie Battlestar is originally built as a capital ship and again drops down into it, kind of like the Excelsior. So it's usually when you have usually what when you do get these things represented online, they are capital ships which are built as well balanced capital ships and they drop down into the cruiser role because you build bigger and better ships which take over as the capital ship role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So. Dan Phillips, in Star Wars, fights are the cruisers in uh, fighters are the term uh, frigates are the terms of cruisers in terms of role. Uh they're not really used as that, unfortunately. Um Nick Waters, Nebula or Miranda class, maybe. I said mentioned Miranda's. Um, hexapons of the Royal Manticore Navy. Steve, my, I do agree in the Royal Manticore and Navy and all these things, but again, I my criteria was it had to be in on screen representation because again, I always find the ones written, the written sci fi's are excellent. They do have cruisers, you know. Um, uh, the Hon of uh, the Honorverse, I haven't really read enough of, so I can't really comment. But the Empire Rising series by DJ Holmes, oh my God, some of those cruisers and the jobs they get up to and going, doing economic warfare raids, turning up, dropping off troops, launching missile attacks, doing these old single ships operations behind enemy lines, or in peacetime going and doing diplomatic missions because you don't want to use the really big ships because they're really expensive, so you prefer to keep them close to your own bases for infrastructure and because they're expensive to move around. That is what a cruiser is for. It's really cool, but no, they don't do that. Bug guy 8829 haven't seen you in a while. The how does the carrier like Atrox Arc Royal in sub-hunting mode be more in danger than its regular roles? Wouldn't they still have their regular escorts and sail around at the same speed? To an extent, but in, it's not really more in danger, but if they're doing it at the beginning of the war, they got a bit close. They weren't keeping far enough back because they were using the same escorts for escorting them as they were for hunting the submarines. Later on, they have escort carriers doing it, and the escort carrier has her three close escorts to protect them from submarines, and they have four or four, uh, two, three or four unit pairs of um, hunting submarine uh, hunting groups hunting them. Nanny Films, Andromeda is not a capital ship as unbelievable as sounds. No, there's actually, they do have the destroyers, which are the big missile ships, which is, I think um, there is a bit, uh, there is a big one, which is the guy, uh, the guy from um, Stargate uh, SG-1 plays the uh, avatar of it uh, in the episode he's in. But um, no, uh, yeah, then uh, the trouble is Andromeda becomes a capital ship by default of being so, and she is the flagship, uh, she's the, the, they are, the Ascendant class were the flagships of the task group, so they are maybe not a capital ship, but they are close enough to a capital ship that that's what they they are as they do as. Of 
Gordon Combs, have you tried to Star Trek mod for Sins of Solar Empire? Not recently. Jeff Hiller, how was the Sea Vixen as an aircraft? I know the backseaters did not like that little cabin. Actually, that's interesting, because Michael Clapp actually did, and he's one of the tallest people I know. And he actually quite liked the little cabin, because um, even though he did say it would kill him if he tried to eject, because he was so tall, he'd just crush his head. Death Squad, is the Federation planet a military dictatorship? Benevolent, but still controlled by Starfleet. Uh, not really, but, you know, they have issues. JP, our crawl only had five destroyers as escorts, and two of them went off to hunt a sub, and the reigning three were not a good enough screen to stop a U-boat. Yep. Comes up, Drakenfell, Jingles, and the Good Doctor should do a World of Warcraft stream. That would be quite fun. I haven't met Jingles yet. Danny Phillips, USNC cruisers are good sci-fi cruisers that end up in the capital role via attrition. Eh, probably, yeah. Jeff, what about the Ak Akira class from DS9? Don't think so. Greg Sarsi, so Razzies then. Actually, that is an interesting thing. We could classify the Excelsior class as Razzies because they are uh, uh, ships of the line which drop down to being frigates used in cruiser crawl. And first, so what is the Blue Cross of World Cruiser? The 10,000 tons is a cruiser, not a destroyer. Clearly, uh, we all have, uh, they, they all have political problems with cruisers. It's associated with the Imperial Pass. Hmm. Kedron, Castle Federation series has an interesting idea for battle cruiser, being cruiser carriers. Yeah. And Flynn, nothing says Global Britain as world cruiser. Well, nothing says Global Britain, really, as using frigates in the cruiser role, which is what arguably the Type 31s are going to be used for, because they're going to be forward present ships. So they're taking on the role of the light cruisers. Um... Jeff Bielan, on a versus based on Starfire, yes, I find his economics whack. Uh, I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm not talking about the economics of it, and that wasn't why I read it, really. And the Expanse, no, I didn't say nothing to have cruisers. They're all sort of capital ships or smaller, or, or capital ships or what I would call escorts, not cruisers. John Shea, slightly off topic, but I nearly forgot to ask, did you say the swordfish was in the Korean War? No. I, 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 I don't think a swordfish actually made it into the Korean War. No, they didn't. I, what I said was that at the same time as the Korean War, the swordfish, the last gasp of them, had been actually involved in early ideas of airborne early warning. And I found a report about it. I haven't actually bothered to check it up because it just sounds like it's probably true. But I also haven't visited the National Archives to check it. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to finish now because it's now I have been talking for a long time and my voice is about to go and I have to do some teaching tomorrow. So I'll say thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And thank you to Saper UK, uh, Babylon 5's White Stars. <sighs> potentially, potentially. But again, I haven't seen Babylon 5 in so many years. I can't really remember on that one. Um, Hada Adam Flinton. Hello, Scipio Africanus. Glad you like my game. Starfleet Command. It's the board answer to Starfleet Battles. Or does any space fleet games? Yes, they are good. JLF, thank you. Greg Satowski, Glonus Dad. Ian Carr, Cahedron, thank you for being here. Sean Mack, thank you. Daniel Freeman, thank you for being here. Jeff Beeler, thank you. Jay Lingoff, thank you. Uh, John Shea, thank you. Andrew Bend, thank you. Hello, Andrew Bend. I don't think I've seen you before, so I'll say hello. If I have seen you before, hello. Michael Truitt, what do you think of the fleet action from Ender's Game? Oh, that's basically Mahan on science fiction. Everything's about having a big battle. Hi, Derp Squad. Yeah, I was supposed to stop by 9 p.m. because I'm, you know, supposed to go cook some tea. And take dog for a walk and get a drink. Right. Jeff Beeler, thank you. Carl Harmon, thank you. Aviator Enterprise, thank you. Night night, everyone. Thank you very much. Bug Guy 8829, thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. All right. Take care, Ian Carr and Lucas Shanich, thank you. Uh, and Greg Salski, thank you. And Howard Maxi, thank you very much. And Cahedron, thank you very much, everyone. Hope to have a good evening, and thank you very much for everyone for sort of being here and chatting away.
Thank you, St. Kitts. And thank you, Sapir UK. Thank you, Anne Anonymous.